to welcome everyone. Thank you very much for joining us uh, for this uh, satellite workshop meeting uh, here at the WAND conference. And uh, we will have a session to deal with uh, antibiotic use and antibiotic resistance in plant pathogenic bacteria. And uh, the link, of course, of this uh, topic with one else. And I will give directly the floor to Giuseppe Stancanelli uh, from EPSA uh, for his presentation of the Plantibio Initiative. Uh, Giuseppe, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, so thank you, Claude Ragaz, for inviting me to this, uh, to this meeting, to give this introductory speech. And uh, uh, thank you for the audience. I will try to be brief and then to open, uh, to give sufficient time for the discussion. Uh, so the, uh, the scope of my speech is to introduce uh, the uh, Planty Bio Initiative. Can you see the, the screen? Yes, uh, but it is in dual mode. <coughs> now better? It better. Yeah. Uh, so uh, my name is Giuseppe Stancanelli. I'm from the Plant Health Risk Assessment Team, uh, Plants Unit, the European Food Safety Authority, which is the uh, body, the agency in the European Union responsible for risk assessment in uh, food safety, animal health, and plant health. And uh, today we discuss about antibiotic resistance because this is one of the biggest threats to the global health and food security worldwide, one of the top 10 uh, risks uh, for uh, the global pub public health. And uh, we have a growing number of infection and high med medical cost and uh, always more difficult treatments. Uh, so uh, there is a, a a very important uh, uh, issue is everyone is responsible for use of antibiotics prudently. Uh, uh, however, we have uh, millions of that, uh, at least 1.2 million of that per year attributable to antimicrobial resistance, bacterial antimicrobial resistance. So it's really a, a global problem. Uh, it is not only a global problem in human health, but also in animal health. There are trends uh, for antimicrobial use in food animals and antimicrobial consumption. Uh, today, what we need to discuss is what is the importance of antimicrobial resistance in plant health. Historically, uh, antimicrobial um, antibiotics have been used for control of Vinia milobora but are now also used to target major plant pathogenic bacteria uh, in different areas of the world, like Pseudo uh, Pseudomonas actinidia, uh, Pathovarius actinidia, Xanthomonas aurice, or one long being or citrus. So uh, our main question is, what is the risk of developing antimicrobial resistance in plant health? Uh, what could be the transfer from the plant pathogenic bacteria to animal or human health? What are in general the mechanism model of transfer of antimicrobial resistance between the different uh, uh, parts of the environment? And what is the link between the plant protection products authorized and antimicrobial resistance? All these questions, unfortunately, have a lot of data gaps. And uh, the reason for this meeting, for this project, is also to try to fill up partly uh, these data gaps. Uh, you could say that uh, the uh, quantity of antimicrobial, of uh, antibiotic use in plants is, is very small compared to what is used in, uh, for uh, animals, what is used in human health, uh, like you can see from the publication of McManus in 2014. Uh, but uh, uh, we are dealing more and more with uh, systemic plant pathogenic bacteria which are a global major, con uh, major concern, which are often quarantine pests, and for which it is always difficult to find uh, control measures, effective control measures. So we have uh, the case of Xylella fastidiosa in, uh, in the Americas and in Europe, one long being in, or, um, nowadays in almost all the citrus growing area uh, worldwide, Xanthomonas aurice, Phytoplasmas, 
Rastonia un poteto, uh, Pseudomonas actinidia, Xanthomonas citri, Ervinia milovora. So, a uh, lot of major uh, global problem, and uh, the uh, question is really, what are the control measures, what are the risk reducing options for the farmer for control of this plant pathogenic bacteria? So uh, what is the role of EFSA? EFSA conduct risk assessment also on plant pathogenic bacteria. Uh, we do pest categorization, quantitative risk assessment, uh, pest survey cards, tools for monitoring, database, we organize uh, um, research conference, for example, Oxylella, uh, we publish a lot uh, of uh, uh, different risk assessment. Here's some example. And uh, uh, we decide to fund the, uh, this plant bio project because uh, plant pathogenic bacteria is a major problem worldwide. And uh, uh, although we think there is a very low use of antibiotic for crop protection, there is a lack of monitoring data. Uh, and this also uh, bring up the concern about the impact of uh, use of antibiotic in uh, plant health and uh, their role in the One Health approach. So this project uh, aimed at uh, systematically collect data on the antibiotic use in plant pathogenic bacteria, on the antibiotic resistance in plant pathogenic bacteria, and on the alternative to the use of antibiotic for control of plant pathogenic bacteria by searching the literature, by searching patents database, technical grade literature, or specific questionnaire. And uh, also use of bioinformatic resource to track antimicrobial resistance in plant pathogenic bacteria or plant associated bacteria. So it's blocked. Excuse me. So we also have problem of terminology because uh, a different term are used, a different meaning. So uh, very often uh, the product are not registered antibiotic or bactericide. But in some part of the world, in some database, I register a fungicide, bacteriostatic agents, antimicrobial. So, a lot of synonym uh, for the molecules, but also for the commercial name. And data on antibiotic use are often not publicly available. And scientific literature is reporting, but only partially uh, this, uh, uh, this aspect. So, we need also to verif verify. Uh, we're careful uh, the data quality because uh, particularly when we deal with data uh, coming from the web or from the gray literature. So uh, data gaps, which are very important, is the data on antibiotic use as plant protection product, the data on the resistance, the impact of antibiotic application on the phytobiome, and the data on alternative strategy for control. So uh, we need to address key questions while, like what is the risk for human and animal health? What is the frequency of mobility of resistance gene? What about the plant associated bacteria? What is the link between antimicrobial resistance in plant pathogenic bacteria and AMR in human and animal health? What is the effectiveness of the risk of alternative control method? Uh, 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 like for example, bacteriophage or plant resistance. So a lot of challenges, a lot of need for cooperation. That's why this meeting is very important. It is very important to cooperate uh, with the international organization like FAO, IPPC, with the regional plant protection organization like EPO, the risk assessment bodies, the national plant protection organization, research group, uh, link with the uh, One Health, with the human animal health, link with the industry, link with the uh, farmer organization. So a lot of uh, uh, activities, and I uh, wish that uh, this morning would be very uh, challenging and uh, interesting and rich of uh, collaboration. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Giuseppe. <clears throat> Maybe we have uh, reactions or, or questions in the audience or for those who are online. I'm looking just 
aussi. If, if not, Giuseppe, maybe I, I ask a question. Uh, for you, what, what is the main challenge uh, concerning the use of antibiotics or, or in, in plant pathology and, and for plant pathogenic bacteria? How do you see this? Um, uh, I think the main challenge uh, comes from the context. Uh, so there is an echo now. Uh, so, uh, because uh, uh, control of systemic plant pathogenic bacteria is normally very difficult. Therefore, the risk uh, for the farmer that uh, if they find uh, an activity which is uh, partially effective for control, they will use uh, more and more quantity. So for me, the risk of uh, antimicrobial resistant plant health is uh, fundamentally the risk of controlling difficult uh, uh, plant pathogenic bacteria and uh, in a targeted way. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's the main challenge from which all the rest uh, is, uh, is coming. Mm -hmm. Okay. So maybe now we will shift if there is no questions or reactions. Yes, Julian? Maybe you should come just here. <laughs> or I will, I will just... Uh, Please. Yeah. Hi, hi, Giuseppe. Um, so, I understand that we're looking at plant pathogenic bacteria and the risks of antibiotics being applied to those systems at, uh, here in Europe or overseas. But to what extent are we monitoring plant pathogenic bacteria, given that the resistance genes uh, or the exposure is to all microbials in that system? Uh, you know, are we? Is it? What should we be looking at? Is, is it the plant pathogenic bacteria? Is that the right thing to be studying, or is it antimicrobial resistance associated with crops? Thank you, Julian. That's, that's a key question, uh, and I think is, uh, uh, is something we need to debate today. Uh, I think it's very important to collect data. So we need to have a picture, a clear picture of the situation, and uh, we need to collect as much data as possible to have this picture with less uncertainty. But uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, what is also very important is to understand the mechanism of transfer, the mechanism of movement, uh, and what is the importance of the different, uh, 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 different uh, system. Uh, so what is the importance of agricultural pathogen? What is the importance of uh, uh, normal uh, Plant community, plant bacteria community. What is important about agriculture, so technique, uh, uh, animal um, production, and human health? Okay. Yes, please. Ah, uh, yes, we have a microphone. Thank you. Hello, my name is John Threlfall. I'm not on your list of participants. But I'm participating later in the week. I've worked with antibiotic resistance for about 40 years, and I was on the Biohaz panel for quite a lot of years, finishing uh, 2018. I'm very ignorant about the use of antibiotics in plants. Could I ask why they are used and how they are used? Are they used, for example, prophylactically? Are they sprayed on? And uh, why are they used? <laughs> I'm sorry about this, but it's, it's, uh, it's not my field. I was just very intrigued to know how they are used and, and, and what sort of quantities they are used and, and why. And so probably the, the presentation by Melanie this morning will give you some uh, uh, ideas on how they are used and, and why they are used. And then the main uh, purpose is really the control of plant pathogenic bacteria, uh, which are really uh, uh, devastating uh, diseases of plants. And uh, in some cases, in some countries, are authorizing the use of, of anti antibiotics for controlling such, uh, such diseases. And we will try to give you some uh, precisions on this. So now we shift to the next presentation that will be given by Jorge Pinto Ferreira from FAO in Rome. And the title of the presentation is Antimicrobial Use and Resistance in Plant Agriculture, a One Health Perspective. And so, Jorge, if you are with us, hopefully, the floor is yours. Hi, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, we do very well. And see the screen? 
Notiert. <lacht> Bene? Yes, we do. Yeah. Ah, perfect. Okay. So thank you very much, and uh, I think it's good. It might maybe there's colleagues uh, joining online from different regions of the world, but for most of us, it seems good morning. So thank you, Claude, for the invitation to make this uh, presentation, and it's my pleasure to be here. I am a veterinarian and uh, with experience in dairy sector. Uh, so my, my experience with plants is mostly since I moved to Rome a year ago and treating the plants in my terrace, and I cannot say the results are that impressive. So I don't think I will change career to a plant specialist based on my results on my plants. But uh, on AMI, I've been working for more than 10 years now. And when I discussed with Claude, I said, ah, if you are a veterinarian, it's interesting because we can see the, how, how things are uh, related or not in terms of the, um, using animals, for example, and using plants. Uh, so uh, the, and, and the, the perspective is that, that I have my background is that mostly on the animal side. And I will uh, discuss a bit of the things and, and the things that the FAO is doing related to this. Um, since I was new to, to the field, I always think that uh, looking back can be useful and learning from, from the past, uh, uh, from a, a constructive uh, perspective. And maybe because my, my sister is an archaeologist, I always like to look uh, back. And uh, it was actually a colleague from the same division as I am, Jeff Lejeune, also a food safety officer here at FAO, that uh, introduced me to this paper that has a, a very uh, clear title, Coping with Resistance to Plant Disease. And the interesting thing is this, this paper was written in 1980, so 32 years ago. And this is a direct quote of the, the, the paper. And it states that in a world in the, on the brick of massive food shortages, making the best use of all the antibiotics in control agents is imperative. Coping with resistance will require intensive effort, but it can be done. So I like the positive ending of it, it can be done. But it is interesting to see that this was written 32 years ago, and it's speaking about massive uh, food uh, shortages. So it's, it's, uh, it's important to look back. And as we know, we are not dealing with something new. It's actually written in a peer-reviewed publication. But it is, it is important to see that we still have so many knowledge gaps. And that's why this, this meeting is more than welcome to try to fill them. Next. Okay, so here we are. In terms of One Health, I think I'm speaking to a, um, a very educated uh, audience. So we don't need to repeat that this One Health. We know what it means. Um, I think we, we lack a lot of knowledge, for example, in terms of soil or environmental health. What happens when we, when antibiotics or antibiotic residues reach the soil? That part of the knowledge is, is really short, I think. Um, but uh, it, it is important to have this global picture. And these days we speak a lot of One Health. It's also something new. I think the first references to it come from the 60s. And we all agree that we need this integrated approach. But it's, it's when it comes to the actual doing it from a One Health perspective that sometimes we face some struggles. And uh, we will over, go over some of them uh, in my next uh, few slides. In terms of data, like I, you all have probably a lot of experience in the, the plant sector. I was recently in a country in Asia, and uh, with, with all the AMR, the AM, AMR and Tumekovo use stakeholders of the country, and the plant sector was represented. And their approach was very interesting. Their approach was like, we don't think we are part of this story, but we are willing to study it. So if you show us the data that this is relevant for AMR, that the plant sector is contributing to the, the AMR issue, then we will start working more on it. So we need to show more data, and uh, Giuseppe just mentioned it, the importance of data, and I think we all also agree with this. Again, looking back, I found this paper from 1970, so it's even older than the previous one, and it was looking at E. coli resistance factors in vegetarians, babies, and non-vegetarians. So again, nothing new. It's just interesting to see that science has also these fashion trends. And sometimes things, it, I guess at the end, is ultimately where the funding goes. But nothing new. But for more than 40 years, we have been looking uh, at uh, this. So references to this, quite old. Much more recent, we, look, we, we try to find references that support our concern about this. We'll find, for example, um, papers showing foodborne outbreaks, AMR foodborne outbreaks. And you've, at least the ones that I found were mostly on imported products. And from the literature, that's what it seems, that in countries where regulations are more strict, the control is more strict, 
it seems that at least in terms of uh, documented evidence, we don't find that strong. When the products are imported from countries where it seems that the regulations is, uh, are less stringent, then that might be the source of problem. But it is important to have this. Uh, we mentioned uh, risk assessment, and for example, the use of streptomycin also came up. And this is also a much more recent, so 2013 reference, 2016 references. There are much more recent uh, evidence of this, and these are important. They have solid ground to start discussing the need to collect even more data and to discuss with the um, policymakers. Then, again, this is an educated audience, so we know about this, that we know that one of the issues that we share uh, the same antibiotics in the different sectors. And this diagram shifted sometimes, some model can be only used in this or that sector. But we know this, that we, we, we share uh, many of the antibiotics in the, the three different sectors, humans, animals, and plants, with a few of those just for veterinary use. When WHO put out these guidelines for uh, the use of antibiotics in food production, it seemed immediately that the food production would only be allowed to use this five classes that uh, most of us do not even know. It seems that it's not that strange, but still, the, 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 we know that at the core, there's many antibiotics, and keeping it focused on antibiotics, that are shared by the, the sectors, the different three sectors. Now, we have been looking at FAO. This is not new for FAO as, as well, and I joined about a year ago, and we started going deeper into this thing, and look, going deeper into antibiotics, and I was very pleased that the title of the workshop, How Does Antibiotic Resistance in Plant Pathogenic Bacteria Impact One Health? Because as we know, if you go broader than antibiotic, then it gets even more complex. So let's focus for now on um, antibiotics. And we were looking at, at very simple, to start, very simple questions. Which antibiotics should we look for in terms of data collection, for example? And there's uh, this excellent uh, report, mostly focused on the UK or based from the UK research, published in 2020, about two years ago, that looked at these mentions very clearly, these four class, three classes plus one extra. So aminoglycosides, it seems clear, especially streptomycin, it seems that we should collect, for example, they don't use on this. And then kazugamycin and gentamicin. So these references, you can find different uh, literature references about these three specific antibiotics and this class, it seems more or less consensual that it's used then tetracyclines, oxytetracyclines, and oxolonic acid, so quinolone. So these, I think, from what I saw in the literature, seems relatively common. And then you have this, it's not really a, a class, the, the streptocycline. So it's a mixture of streptomycin and tetracycline. So it's also mentioned several times in the literature, but it's not really a, um, a class per se. So when we're looking at which antibiotics should we focus on, there's three classes came up. And uh, the, this is zooming in, the, we should focus on this. However, if you look at this reference, for example, published uh, more or less recently, and it's focusing on the mandarin production, then it's also reference to beta-lactams. And these are all very familiar with, with ampicillin, amoxicillin, pelicillin, um, highly important uh, for, critically important for um, humans, very commonly used in humans, for example, and not, not only oxytetracycline, but tetracycline itself. Uh, another uh, molecule class that we should be looking at. So the, the, the scope would be a bit broader, and because here there's reference to the use of beta-lactams in plant production. And there's also this very, very good review paper by Philip Taylor and Robert Reeder, where it's more even expanded. And for example, I must say, I had never heard that the one that you can see there in the middle, Ningnamycin, I never heard about this antibiotic before, but you see the ones that we mentioned before, kazugamycin, streptomycin, tetracycline, oxytetracycline, gentamycin, oxolonic, oxolinic acid. These are very commonly referred, and again, amoxicillin, referred throughout the, 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 um, the literature that they are used in plants uh, with a few more to, to look at. So, but these, these references, I think they, I found them excellent, very useful to start at least telling us which antibiotics we should be looking at and understanding better the epidemiology, understanding better the, the, the data that we are looking for. One important note about this, and again, being relatively new to this field, sometimes it's useful. So I was trying to understand if I should call antibiotics pesticides. And I think it's a fact that in many countries, um, antibiotics are classified as a pesticide, together with fungicide, herbicides, etc. 
But I would like to call your attention to this report published in 2018 as a joint meeting on pesticide management by FAO and WHO. And it very clearly states, this is a direct quote from the, the, that report, that uh, this report recommends that antibiotics used for human and animal health should not be registered as pesticides by countries. So this is the verbs in policy matter a lot. And the verb is recommends, is a recommendation. But I, I thought it was important to see that, and then I spoke here with colleagues, and it seems that in the discussion, it was mostly, at least in new antibiotics that come out that are commercialized, and we all know there's not that many, but they should not be registered as pesticides because it leads to um, several misunderstandings, I would say. So it's important to have this, this report in mind, and the verb used is recommendation. Then, why were we so concerned about this? We, sp we spoke about One Health and the topic that I was in, in as, and the topic of the workshop, the topic of my presentation is One Health. And we all agree with this. Then we, come, we zoom and we try to understand what we mean by this. And in terms of lists of antibiotics and management of antibiotics, we all know this, the WHO list, the WHO Critical Important Antibiotics list and the different criteria and the different classes, the critical important, et cetera. We are very familiar with this. And the, the OIE1, now WOAH, the cat categorization of antibiotics, antimicrobials, focus on animals. And this is the main point. Both of them are focused by default in the, the, the WHO1 in humans, the OIE1 in animals. And is also, we can discuss perhaps in the round table, when we say critically important in these two lists, we actually mean very different things. But to keep in mind that one is focusing on humans and the other one is focusing on animals. By default, they were mentioned like this. Now, if you speak with policymakers in the country, they will tell, okay, we want to do it right, but it's confusing because WHO1 gives us the ranking according to the importance to humans. OIA gives us the ranking according to animals. But there's, for example, the plant sector is, at, at, to our knowledge, missing at the global level. And besides these lists, important to emphasize that the regional lists and national lists, and at the European level, we have very good uh, ranking of uh, antimicrobials than, for example, for EMA. So there's this global, and regional, and national ones. But this focus of them are different. So WHO humans or IE animals, we were missing the plants one. So that's what this, miss, this piece was missing. And that's what we started developing a couple of months ago. And the, the, what we envision is this. First, we want to have a list aligned, the same mentality aligned with what WHO did for humans and OIE did for animals. We want to have also this list of importance of categorization for plants, for the plant sector. And that's why understanding which antibiotics we are talking about, it's so important. Which antibiotics and then how important are them? So we developed a draft and we shared with uh, some experts and Claude, for example, was one of the ones that kindly commented on it. And I see this meeting as an opportunity to create a network, to, to reach out to experts like all of you, to ask for feedback in a document like this, for example. And so this is what this is, how it will be look like. It's very simple. It's which class are we talking about? Which molecules are we speaking about? And what they are used for? And of course, we need to speak about legally used for, register used for. And then there will be a ranking of categorization like we are, we are uh, doing, used to read for WHO and uh, OIE. So hopefully with this, by no means we want to add to the confusion, but instead, once we have the plant sector represented, then there will be for sure several rounds of negotiation and we can create a one health list that can be used by countries in an integrated way, in the green integrated one health, one health way to say, okay, if you consider the three sectors, then these are the ones that are more important to preserve, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But at the moment, it seems that at the global level, we don't have such list, and that's why we decided to start working on it. Just a quick note on this. I think I'm speaking mostly to a European uh, audience, but I was curious to see how the US is looking at the next week. I'll be in the US in a meeting focusing on uh, resistance also in plants. So there's also a, a very much interest in, in across the ocean. And uh, if you see this, this uh, statement paper from the Society of Infectious Disease Pharmacists, again, this society is not just American, but it seems to be very much uh, based in the US. And there's two things that uh, um, 
I, I saw were quite interesting. One is this figure in the middle of the slide. It's super simple and very, very obvious. As a graphic bar, like the amount used in livestock or humans is so much higher than the one that it seems to be used in crops. That's why the focus has been so much in other sectors and less in plants. And uh, we can discuss how uh, uh, much of uh, this data can be used. But I mean, visually, it's very uh, uh, meaningful to look at this and see that's why the focus perhaps in crops is not so uh, big so far. And then despite this, in the position statements, the last one, position six there, says we should look into this. And this is also important to see that. And uh, you know, having such two important regions align on this is a matter of concern is uh, somehow um, important and useful for future steps. What is FAO up to? We have a plant production and protection division that developed the work plan for the plant sector in between now and 2025, so three, four years plan. And the four key areas are focusing on this, evidence and data collection, institutionalization of AMR, meaning making sure that we have good regulations, policy programs, promoting integrated pest management, Capacity development, always a critical piece of our work at FAO, and awareness raising, communication, and advocacy. So I will, it, again, I see this meeting not in a one-way dialogue, but a, a starting point to start working on together on this. So as you can see, under these four key areas, there's a lot that can be developed if we do it together. Then there's two new databases that are being developed, and I just wanted to bring everybody attention to this. One, you see that the title, the, the top of the, the slide is called TISA. And now it's quadripartite, but when this platform was developed, this was still a tripartite. So it's called Tripartite Integrated Surveillance System for AMR and AMU. And this, this platform that is now currently being developed in the final stages of development, which is a very significant progress, will have data from WHO on humans, the data from GLASS, data from the OIE or WOAH on antimicrobial use in animals, and FAO will contribute to, do, to these species, AMR in animals and food, and AMU in plant production. These were two pieces that were missing, again, from this One Health perspective. We didn't have this data at the global level. So this platform is currently being built, and initially, just to keep your expectations appropriate, it will display global data, and there's a lot that we can speak about because even, for example, having a global map, since the organizations do not exactly divide the world in the same regions, can be very challenging. So, But it is important to have this new platform being built in the final stages, and the, the data that FAO started to collect to fill in this, this gap that existed. And to fill in this gap, the, the FAO platform is called INFAR, and this, this, of course, you can have my presentation, and this slide has a lot of information, but this is just the only thing that the key message is, there's a new platform being built by FAO, it's my colleague Alejandro Dorado Garcia that is mostly the, 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 at the core of this work, and it will collect data. And at the moment, the focus will be mostly on AMR, in animals. This was one of the gaps identified. So an OIE is collecting antimicrobial use in animals, but the AMR in animals at the global level was not being collected. So that's at the moment the initial point, and believe me, it's really challenging, quite complex, but that will be the moment. And then we'll focus on plants, and again, that's why this, this meeting can be useful to do it at this point, that we can develop it together. This is the rollout of this infarm platform. At the moment, we are developing it with meetings every week to do the IT platform, and et cetera. And if you see there in year 2024, there is the, the expansion, so in about two years, to start using antimicrobial use in plants or crops. We wish it was faster, but again, these this global platforms can be quite complex in terms of collecting data from different countries, making sure that we have uh, sharing agreements with the countries, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I think it's positive to see that this platform is the final stages of preparation, the pilot stage, and then it will be expanded to collect information in, in crops. And also in terms of which data we'll collect, just to bring also to, to the attention that according with the monitoring evaluation of the, the uh, GAP, the Global Action Plan, there's one indicator that mentions specifically that countries ideally should collect uh, levels of this. An indicator 4.6 that you can see there mentions specific levels and trends in sales of use of pesticides 
for the purpose of controlling bacterial fungal disease in plant production. And again, that's why I brought up the term pesticides. And again, you are very familiar with this. But see here it's mentioned pesticides. It doesn't specifically say antibiotics or antimicrobials. But this is, it's important to have in mind that in the monitoring evaluation uh, work or uh, framework of the gap, there's a specific indicator that uh, it, this is helpful for countries to, say, to make, make sure that there is a need to collect data to fulfill also the monitoring evaluation uh, framework of the, the gap. So the, the, the final slides on these gaps, I think we are all familiar with them. We really need to understand much more this epidemiology in longer, um, in the broad terms. What happens, for example, when I treat the cow and then the manure comes uh, uh, from, from the farms, it goes into the soils, it goes into the plants. Uh, how does this reach to humans? Which risk are we speaking here? And Giuseppe made a very good introduction to the point, and I know that throughout the morning we'll have presentations on this. Then we, we, we need to, under, to quantify. That's why we are missing, well, keep speaking about data, quantify the relationship between these we use and the resistance in humans, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the quantification is very important to avoid making just guesstimates. I think uh, we should, uh, as much as possible, avoid the I think this or I think that and have solid data to confirm the, what we are stating. There's a lot of challenges, but challenges sometimes can be good. We know that the enforcement of policies is difficult and sometimes they're not even a policy. The continuing education needs to be continuously done. The quality of pesticides, for example, is another issue. And we, are, we just started the also pilot study in Rwanda to look at the quality of veterinary products. So maybe this can be expanded to the quality of uh, antibiotics used in plants. But it's a quality that we are know that uh, quality issues are something that we are aware of. And they don't use. I think this is uh, what we are looking for. And for example, as Claude said, this meeting can be the beginning of further collaboration. And we, I cl clarified with colleagues building up more directly the infarm platform. And inputs on this are very useful. So for example, which data should we actually be collecting? Should we think aligned with what we do in the animal sector and measuring milligrams of active ingredient per kilogram of biomass? in animals, this is where I think, or DDD, the, uh, um, like we do for humans in most developed countries, or should we be doing it in a different way? So these are the, the, the inputs from experts like you that will be very useful to make sure that this global platform is, uh, is useful for the future. So some of the things that we can work together in the near future is conduct studies on the relationship between microbial use associated pesticides, antibiotics, and the development of AMR. Under Canadian funding, we, are, uh, we will develop a handbook on risk assessment and being user-friendly in low- and middle-income countries. So we got the funding, we got the consultants to work on it. Again, inputs from experts are always um, useful to make sure that th the risk assessment is doable as much as possible in countries with limited resources. The surveillance I just said, which data should we be collecting and the issue of sharing is also for privacy reasons and trade issues is, uh, is, are important to keep in mind. We have a new project called ACT, uh, Antimicrobial Codex Tests, focusing on the implementation of codex standards related to antimicrobial use and surveillance. And here I mean mostly the revised code of practice and the guidelines for integrated surveillance. And we are implementing this, country in this project in six countries, four in Asia, two in South America. But I think the codex standards were expanded to plant production. So this is a new challenge for all of us to make sure that they are implemented. But overall, I think this is it. We are becoming more and more aware. As I said, this is nothing new, but we are becoming more and more aware as international organizations. And the pro probably what we are looking for here is to move from developing of guidelines, for example, or just the uh, um, stewardship of frameworks more into the action of implementing what we know, collecting data to make sure that we actually contribute from this one health perspective of the, the control of AMR. So Claude, I'll stop here and uh, I'm sure we have uh, uh, at the end or here and time for some discussion, hopefully. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jorge, for this uh, excellent presentation and highlighting the FAO initiatives in uh, antimicrobial use and in resistance. Uh, we are running a little bit short of time, but maybe there is a burning question at this stage, and I keep the idea, uh, of, of course, uh, of the discussion more in depth in, in the round table that we, we will have around noon uh, this morning. I'm looking at the audience, if there is a, a question for Jorge. 
Yes, please. There is a microphone. So my name is Renata Leuschner. I'm uh, in the pesticide residue team in the plants unit, in the same unit as Giuseppe now. Um, and I have a question mainly towards the regulatory framework. Because uh, pesticide residues, we have, of course, the MRL regulation. So um, we look at residues at maximum residue levels. And then the other piece of regulation is the um, authorization and renewal regulation of pesticide, active substances, and also products. Now, yes, um, I mean, I guess the antibiotics are not uh, approved pesticide active substances per se. I, I don't know. I'm asking. And then, uh, of course, the approval is always being done in the context of representative uses, so-called GAPS, good agricultural practices in this context, uh, mm. which are the conditions of use. So how do I apply? Do I spray, foliar spray, uh, soil applications, just to name very few? So that would be my question. How do we see this? in antimicrobials in the f regulatory European framework, maybe first mm. of all. <laughs> well, the European, well, at far we, we, we cannot just focus on the, the, the European, but I think the, the main thing, the, this report that I mentioned in terms of regulation of pesticides versus antibiotics, I think it's, it's something really important. Uh, many countries, and again, we, when you go to different regions, the, the, it's not even, there's not even the awareness that antibiotics are used in plants because they are labeled as pesticides. So I fully agree with you. There's a lot of work to be done with our legal colleagues, and they are engaged in this work as well, to make sure that uh, there's awareness of this, that it is the same antibiotics, and antibiotics are used as pesticides. So that clarification is important to have. And then to make sure that it's, it is enforced. So I, I fully agree with you. There's a lot of work to do in regulation. And these misunderstandings between pesticides versus antibiotics needs to be very clear in the, um, the regulations. So yeah, the legal part is absolutely very critical. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Jorge. And uh, we will keep in touch for the, table, uh, the round table uh, at noon uh, thank this you. morning. Thank you very much. Okay, the next presentation I will present to you myself. Uh, and the title proposed for this uh, presentation is Improving Data Collection on Antibiotic Use in Plant Health, Challenges and, and Perspectives. And so this is just to highlight what we have been doing so far with this uh, Plantibio project. Um, and, and maybe also to stress the difficulty to collect data on antibiotic use. Um, so I will start when the presentation is on the screen, yes. So is it possible to have the presentation full screen? Or should I do something? Okay. Is it possible to have it full screen or? No. <laughs> well, otherwise I will present it like this. And so Giuseppe already presented the project, so I, I will be shorter maybe on some of these items. Um, Maybe to start with this, uh, I, I, I will just <laughs> it seems my presentation is reluctant to okay, so uh, I, I think there is no need to 
to remind you the importance of uh, losses uh, to crops uh, worldwide by plant pathogenic bacteria, uh, estimated over $1 billion every year, and uh, global trends in increasing uh, problems with bacteria in plant herbs. And uh, so we have already touched the fact that antibiotics are currently used uh, in crop cultivation, but the amount of antibiotic use in plant health is very low compared to the amount used for animal and, and human health. And uh, Jorge already highlighted the, the review by Taylor and Rier, uh, suggesting that antibiotic use in crop protection is maybe more widespread than uh, previously thought. And also maybe important to highlight is the fact that uh, numerous antibiotics are ori originating from the environment, from the soil, and so uh, they do exist already uh, there. And so uh, this is probably useful. So Giuseppe has uh, mentioned the project. There are three items in the project. The first one is collect and review data on antibiotic use for the control of plant pathogenic bacteria. This is the topic I will uh, speak about today. There is also item two, which is collect and review data and information on resistance to antibiotics and plant pathogenic bacteria. And, and this part will be presented to you by Marie Verhagen this morning. And we have a third item, which is look at uh, alternative and innovative treatments for the control of systemic plant pathogenic bacteria. So what can, can we do without the antibiotic? Are there some solutions? And maybe this will be touched also a little bit by Melanie this morning. Um, speaking about uh, collection of data on the use of antibiotics, um, we had uh, different strategies. A first look at what has been published in the scientific literature. I will be short on this, but uh, there is of course information and some have been already highlighted by Jorge this morning. An interesting approach was to look at the gray literature on uh, antibiotic use, uh, and I will try to show what we have done so far on this. And the third item was to look at patents. And uh, this is mostly uh, also to look at what will come next, I would say, as uh, control measures and maybe new or upcoming antibiotics that are proposed for plant health. Giuseppe already mentioned antibiotic is not always the term that is used in plant health, and we should really stress this. This is an issue. So looking at the scientific literature, we have been reviewing uh, almost 5,000 papers, uh, focusing on the ones that are really dedicated on the use of antibiotic as plant protection products, which makes mi much less, of course, publications. Jorge already mentioned excellent reviews that have been uh, published, some of these uh, quite recently, uh, like the one of, of Miller uh, and colleagues in 2022. And there are also some reports providing detailed surveys or informations uh, focusing on the worldwide scale or, or more locally, like Taylor and Rieger mentioned previously, the report of FERA and, and several ones. And there are also some publications providing information on local use. And Jorge pointed out this uh, publication by Chandratik in, in Thailand with the use of uh, antibiotics uh, for control of citrus diseases. So when you look at what is uh, published, the outcome is that uh, we have approximately 20 countries where there is a report of official use of antibiotic as plant protection products. Giuseppe already mentioned major bacterial diseases like Erwinia millivora. Historically, this one was the, the one uh, targeted with this antibiotic use uh, for controlling uh, the fire blights. Xanthomonas aurisei in Asia is a major problem on rice, and it is also probably a cause of the use of antibiotics for controlling this disease. Pseudomonas actinidiae in New Zealand was a problem, and the reason probably for the use of antibiotics there. And uh, more recently, uh, citrus greening, Yuan Longbing, or bacterial diseases like Ralstonia selonacearum or Pectobacterium are also uh, targeted by the, the use of antibiotics. As already mentioned, there are not so many antibiotic molecules that are uh, used in, in plant health, uh, and they have already been listed or quoted by your case, so I think there is no point just, just to stress this. Maybe what I would like to mention is that some of these are only used 
for uh, the plant treatments and are not used in animal health or human health. And this may be a, a, a key uh, point that should be underlined here. And of course, if you look broader in the literature, then there is a lot of trials that are made in several countries to look at the effectiveness of some uh, uh, antibiotics and sometimes with a broader range, uh, as mentioned already by Yorki also. There is a limitation to look at the scientific literature because the, there is an evolution in, in the way uh, uh, antibiotics are authorized. For example, the, some were authorized in 2000 and are now forbidden in some countries, meaning that if you look at the literature, you should be very careful about the, the time uh, when this was published and what uh, was targeted there. <coughs> and uh, there is only a limited number of publications really dealing about the use. So the idea was to go for gray literature and look uh, what about uh, exploring uh, the web. The problem is really how to start this. And uh, we have used a, a three-step strategies. First, there are official databases on, on pesticides. And so we, we have had a look at antibiotics that are officially authorized somewhere. And I have listed several of these databases that we looked at uh, here. And if you do so, you end up also with the commercial names uh, for antibiotics. Um, and, and, and you have several that are listed here. And I will show you a slide just uh, after this, uh, this one, just to highlight this. And of course, you may end up also with official uh, companies that are listed producers of antibiotics. Um, but the, the most efficient way we found to look at the use of uh, official use of antibiotics is to try to get the information from the National Plant Protection Organization uh, via their official websites, if it's possible. Of course, if you want to look at this, you need to probably use uh, translation in the local language because, of course, all these sites are not in English. But this way, you may uh, get uh, quite a lot of information uh, using this, this type of information. And this is just to, to show you, we spoke about streptomycin. And here you've got several names of products uh, and in bold the companies that are selling these streptomycin in, in plant health, um, looking at uh, a real diversity. But uh, of course, if you introduce streptomycin on the web, you won't get all these data. It's very difficult to collect, and so you, you have to be systematic in, in the way you search the information. And it's just an, to give you an overview of, of uh, what is uh, done. I have chosen Japan, I'm sorry. Uh, I had to choose a country, uh, how we did proceed also to show you. So via the websites, you have here uh, different names uh, here for uh, um, antibiotics that are used, the companies, company website. If you go on the company's website in English, no indications about antibiotic. You don't, you don't find anything. But if you translate this in Japanese, then you get the information. And uh, you may get information like this. This is a translation, a Google translation, OK? Uh, and so you see that, of course, well, antibiotics are used on the different types of crops. Cucumber, tomato, bell pepper, onion, plenty. Uh, and I have now a list, of course. Uh, so this is the information translated from Japanese to English. But this is not directly available, but through a, a gray literature search, then you get the information. <coughs> it takes some time. Um, and, and, and this is for oxalic acid, for example. You have also. But the, the best way to get the information is to go on the official agricultural chemicals inspection station website where you've got the official list of antibiotics that are authorized in Japan for use. But you need to translate them. And then you've got kazugamycin, oxylenic acid, validamycin, oxytetracycline, streptomycin, all listed as fungicides, of course. So if you look for antibiotics, nothing. But if you go in the list, for the fungicides, then you get these antibiotics that are authorized officially in Japan and that are commercialized. This is just an example, of course, and Japan is a nice example because it is quite uh, 
uh, easy to find the information. It is transparent, and you've got the information on this. So we have done this uh, for several countries, one by one, looking at the official sites in the country, sometimes in Spanish, Portuguese, French, English, and so on, trying to get the translation in the local language. And the outcome is what you have here uh, on the screen. So we have 85 countries that officially ban the use of antibiotics in plant health uh, so far. And we have listed more than 30 countries that allow their use. And I have just, the color is green, no use. Light blue, one uh, antibiotic uh, authorized for use. Uh, dark blue, two. Uh, yellow, <coughs> three. And then four and five. This is under construction. We, we, we should be cautious, of course, because again, we consult the website at one moment, sometimes we have some data that are not so strong available through this. So this needs probably to be uh, looked at quite in, in depth. And Marie will provide you some more indications about uh, the data we have collected so far. There are some limitations for, the, for this approach because of course you need really to, to cross check the data you've got out of this. Even if you have access to official websites, um, this should be verified, and this is a step we should go for. This is a very time-consuming approach because you do this country by country and then searching for the information on the official website. Sometimes you have to scroll through two, three, four pages, but you get the information. You have often to use translation of the language. And again, uh, we, you should look when this list was uh, published. Is it the list for 2015 or the list for 2021, which is different, of course. A problem that has been highlighted by Yorke is that up to now, there is only a poor quantitative data available for, except, except for a few countries. So there were some data, and there are some data available for the USA, uh, quite clearly. Uh, New Zealand is also publishing information, and India also, uh, even if you have to search for it. And I just placed this, but uh, for China, um, there are some publications on the web uh, mentioning huge amount of antibiotics use, but I think we should be very cautious about this because there is no real uh, verification behind this. Just to highlight in the States, very clear uh, information where the antibiotics are used, uh, estimations for the use uh, year by year. Uh, very nice. If we could have this on a worldwide scale, of course, it would be wonderful. Uh, and, and to finish my talk, uh, I, I want just to point out that this project, this Pontypri project, we are focusing on the use of antibiotics as plant products. Uh, so this is a tiny amount of the antibiotic used in agriculture. And uh, we are asking what is the risk uh, and how this use could contribute to the emergence of resistance and what could be the impact of this on human health, for example. But we don't have to forget that we have antibiotics associated with water and possibly irrigation on the crops. We have antibiotics associated with the soils, naturally, or uh, with uh, manure, farm effluents, wastewater muds, which might be very important also for the crops. And, and this comes back to the, the, the questions by, by, by Julian to, to Giuseppe this morning. So what should we look at? And of course, probably uh, looking at, at resistance uh, in or associated with the plants, and maybe not only to plant pathogenic bacteria, but also there is a lot of work on the phytobiome, so the, the, the microbes associated with the plants, not only plant pathogenic bacteria, but uh, bacteria naturally occurring with the plants. And these may also carry some resistance genes, and, and maybe we should also have uh, a, a look at this. And that's the end of my talk. So just a, a short overview of the methodology that we have been uh, developing so far. Uh, <coughs> uh, the outcome of it up to now, um, the countries that have been listed uh, with official use of antibiotics. Um, I mentioned some are only used as plant protection products. And of course, uh, this highlights the needs of robust data on antibiotic use. Uh, authorized molecules, also we have been pointing out unauthorized mol uh, use. Uh, it is possible to buy antibiotics via the web uh, quite easily. Uh, and, and, and so 
We know that uh, in some places antibiotics are used even if they are forbidden. The question of quantification is very important. And of course, probably look at the crops that are targeted by this antibiotic use. And we wanted to, to have this link with the one else perspective. Uh, also envisage the question more, more widely. And as I mentioned, uh, do not forget the phytobiome and the bacteria associated with the plants. And this is the end of my talk. Uh, so the collaborator at, at my university, Marie Verhagen, uh, Marie-Paul Manjo from the Louvain Drug Institute, uh, Thomas Burgo who contributed, and Jacques Maillon, who is the specialist of uh, uh, bacteria and bacillus. And Giuseppe, uh, Marco Potasso, Franz Stresel, Ernesto Ljubljana from EFSA, and Roman Wagner, who contributed also uh, to this project. So thank you very much for listening. And if you have questions, I would be happy to take one or two. Jonathan. This is, this is a very trivial, very trivial question, but when you showed the Japanese site, they, they listed something called Cercospora beetle. And I was wondering if you ever tried to figure out what that was. Wow. <laughs> uh, no, no, no. I, I, it was, it I, was I I, the other ones I recognize as bacteria, diseases caused by bacteria. Yeah. Cercospora is a fungus. And but, beetle, no, but it doesn't make any sense at all. No, no, no. But, <laughs> but yeah, I just. Maybe, maybe it, translation. Yeah. And, but also, uh, some of the antibiotics are used also against fun, uh, fungal diseases. And, and this should be stressed also. Yeah, I, I, I'm and aware so, of that. And when, when you, of course, if you stay with the classical ones, and when we spoke about streptomycin, oxalinic acid, uh, uh, but if you go a broader uh, range, uh, you have uh, Ning Nang Missin or Zhang Chang Missin and so on. And, and then there, these molecules are, have a are used quite broadly sometimes. And uh, the question also, uh, are they used adequately? And, and what is the purpose of their use? Uh, these are questions. But these are <laughs> molecules that are used only for agriculture and, and crop protection, meaning that also it is maybe a different uh, question compared to uh, classical antibiotics, I would say. Joe. Thank you, Claude. Uh, my question is also referring to the, the presentation of uh, the previous presentation of Jorge. Uh, you show that the use at, at the moment in agriculture is very minor compared to human and animal. But in case uh, the practice of using uh, anti, uh, antibiotics in agriculture will, will spread, the amount will be massive and, uh, and the risk, I think, uh, increasing uh, so when, when, when we, we should be um, careful not to be misleading. And, and, and the, the idea of the project is really to, to look at it from a scientific point of view. So when we say in agriculture we are using less antibiotics, it's because of the figures of the quantity of antibiotics that are known to be used in agriculture. And if you look at the states, for example, this is quite clear. It is much less, and, and you have seen the picture of Jorge Ferreira, uh, now, uh, where, where, of course, the amount used in, in animal health is, is so huge compared to plant health that it is different. But the question is also, uh, what is the impact of this maybe use, because antibiotic is directly applied on the plants, sometimes on products that are directly uh, eaten, con consumed by, by the people, and uh, what is also the presence of an antimicrobial resistance, uh, genes of resistance associated with the bacteria associated with these plants that have been treated? And uh, that is the question. As, and as you mentioned also, of course, if you open the possibility of, of use, what is the risk around this? And this is really the questions that we are trying to address in this project. So we hope by the end we will come with an, with an idea how to deal and how to uh, evaluate the risk uh, around these uh, questions. Okay, so I suggest to give the floor to Julian Smith. So the last presentation before uh, we'll break this morning, and the, please. And, and the presentation on Julian is on improving data collection on antibiotic use in plant health. 
Oh no, sorry, this is not it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Julian. How classical plant risk analysis may be applied to antimicrobial resistance risk in trade? Excellent. So the okay. floor is yours. Thank you. So you should use this. Okay, let me, let me just practice. Ah, okay, I'm good. Okay, so this is a, a bit of an ideas piece, I suppose, really, but it sort of presupposes that um, you know, one health to me is tending to be dominated between animal health and human health in that axis of zoonosis. And it's tended to overlook the role of plants in the environment as a, as a driver of health and the fact that animals and humans eat plants. And so when you start to think about antimicrobial resistance, then you think about gene transfer and horizontal gene transfer uh, and the risks around that. I think you know, this is quite a good subject to try to bring in plants into the One Health agenda. So this talk looks at pest risk analysis as a, as a well-tried and well-proven uh, uh, approach to assessing risk of plant um, diseases, pests, uh, insects, uh, fungal diseases, bacterial diseases, viruses, all, all pests uh, associated with trade, and how you might then sort of control the movement of those pests and pathogens uh, globally. So the, the talk overview is, is like this. It's just, you know, what is the concern? And, and, and people have just started to discuss that today. You know, what is pest risk analysis? And, and then how might that be applied to antimicrobial resistance? So what is, is our concern really here, or at least in the context of pest risk analysis? You know, suggest that, that we start to monitor and we start to understand where particular microbial resistance genes are and aren't so prevalent in the world. Maybe then we want to put in practices that control the movement of antimicrobial resistance genes, or, or at least to see to what extent we can do that. Uh, and in this, we're looking at crop plants as the commodity that's traded and whether there would be any basis by which you could start to assess the risk of movement of oranges in trade or, or alfalfa feed, animal feed, etc., uh, from one country to another in context of particular antimicrobial microbial resistance genes. So not the organisms, but the genes. So plant pathogenic bacteria and the application of antibiotics to control plant pathogenic bacteria may be the primary driver by which antimicrobial resistance evolves but it's not necessarily going to be in those plant pathogenic bacteria that the antimicrobial resistance is. There's just as many other microbes associated with those cropping systems as the bacteria, just that we're not necessarily monitoring them. So antimicrobial resistance will occur in, in, in those systems, but most probably not in the pathogenic bacteria, arguably. Um, so then, you know, we know what's known, what's unknown in sort of overseas production, you know, and Claude just started to, to, to uh, unpack uh, the, the good examples and the less good examples. Uh, then in your know, context of how will transfer happen? You know, so it comes across in trade, people eat fruit directly, and that's a risk because they, they're coming directly in contact with it, or, or that fruit or material might go into the farm system and the environment and then find its way back into the food supply chain and animals and so on. So there's direct and indirect ways in which antimicrobial resistance may come into bear. And then, animal organisms. <laughs> I'll look at this way. Yeah, so we know what some of the risks will be, and we know which uh, which diseases have, uh, you know, which bacterial, uh, human pathogens, and, and animal pathogens are, uh, have antimicrobial resistance arising in them. But there will be other antimicrobial res resistance genes that evolve that we're not so familiar with. So there'll be the knowns and the unknowns. This is just a, a really bad. Uh, a demonstration of my PowerPoint skills to sort of give an idea of how things might tr move along. So, you know, you can have a farm system uh, in, in, say, in the US or at somewhere where there's alfalfa, there's livestock, you know, there's feed coming into the livestock, there's waste going back to the alfalfa, there's antibiotics going into the livestock. That's, if I was to design an experiment where antimicrobial resistance would evolve, I'd do something like this. That's my, my closed system uh, where I, I would concentrate antimicrobial resistance probabilities in a system. Then you have the harvest. Alfalfa goes export across to uh, the currently Saudi Arabia, uh, UAE, Qatar. Huge volumes of, of feed are going uh, internationally to feed livestock. The livestock there create waste. And they begin going to the, the agricultural systems of that country. So that's a pathway by which antimicrobial resistance might move in, in feed. And then you might have oranges, which I mentioned, or, or apples. 
So an interesting uh, uh, context here is with uh, an orange, you peel the orange, and then arguably the risk of antimicrobial resistance on the inside of an orange might be less than on the outside of an orange, just by the nature of the bacteria that are associated with the orange. So if you peel the orange, you might massively reduce your risk of, of acquiring uh, antimicrobial resistance genes in your gut into the in systems. Or you might go into processing, in which case there's uh, another pathway there. You get the waste and this on, and it comes across in trade. So that's sort of just to give some ideas of how antimicrobial resistance might move and what we might sort of start to think about. So I sort of assume that most of us, I thought that perhaps as an EFSA uh, event, pest risk analysis is something which we're all very familiar with, but I would say a few things about it. Uh, so pest risk analysis is sort of contrived by the International Plant Protection Convention, IPPC, FAO. It's a well-established methodology for assessing the risk of pests in trade and identifies with the idea that you have a pest and a pathogen in one country that is emerging or, or, or some sort of uh, risk to another country where you don't have the same risk. So you can put, you then do this sort of very detailed, very structured analysis where you gather and you analyze and you evidence the risk associated with that trade movement and then you communicate it. So it's a well-established process and EFSA have taken it to another level arguably uh, in recent years through the Plant Health Panel uh, and done an exceptional good of, of looking at that. And the EU as an exemplar of pest risk analysis is, is you know, there to be hold for the, the rest of the world. One of the good things about pest risk analysis is it identifies what we know and what we don't know and the research gaps associated with that. And it also can then lead to the, the suggestion of management and regulatory regulations that can be implied. So it's a really structured approach and it's excellent for communication. It's great for policy makers, great for, for, for badgering those who are our decision makers. So as an approach, one of the things is, is an antimicrobial resistance gene an infectious organism? And I suppose you know, we would say it is because it can transfer from one uh, organism to another. It causes disease. So it's, 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 it probably fulfills the criteria of, of a, a, a pest uh, or a disease contagious a, a organism that can cause disease. You then need to think in the pest risk analysis whether if you're going to try and look at the management strategy between two countries, what's the trigger to think that there's a, a risk there that, may, that motivates you to look at, do the pest risk analysis? You, can't, you have to reason to do this. So some of the things that might have occurred could be that uh, the country that you're, or, or the commodity that you're importing, you're aware that they're now doing a different practice. So that country is starting to use antibiotics, whereas it didn't before. So that might be something to consider. You might get a report that there's an, a, a prevalence or an emergence of a particular antimicrobial resistance gene in the country, which is, you think is, is not so prevalent in your country. So you might want to maintain that in balance. So again, that would be a trigger by which a pest risk analysis could be applied. There could be some sort of civil unrest or a lack of confidence in the system. So a system that used to be managed very well for whatever reason now isn't managed so well. And that, again, is another reason why you might start to do a pest risk analysis, just to see if the, 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 the practices by which the, uh, the, manage, the risk of antimicrobial were seen as sufficient may now not be sufficient. So pest risk analysis has these stages of introduction, entry, and establishment. So entry is the pathway by which the, 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 the antimicrobial resistance gene might move across. So I'll talk about the gene rather than the organism, because I think the gene is really what we're interested in. Uh, it's it's be very useful to know which organism the gene is contained within, uh, because that will be critical to working out how it might establish in our environment. But you, in the, so the first question is, is that gene as that uh, antimicrobial associated with the commodity coming across? And you know, so, uh, and if it's a, a, an orange where you've got the antimicrobial uh, practices, then you, you know, you've got a reason to think that it might be. So you could have a detection system that looks to, to identify whether the, that organism's there. And then if you can see that it probably is, does have a chance to be associated with the commodity. So. You know, there's a, a, a history of association, such as with feed and where they've got the livestock systems going around and where there's antibiotics in, in use. Then you then, next question is whether in the transportation or in the processing of that commodity before or during transportation, that antimicrobial res resistance gene is removed from uh, the commodity. So is there a practice in place that takes it out of the system? 
So if you were looking at oranges, if they were juiced before they came across to the UK, probably that would reduce any risk of antimicrobial resistance in that commodity. You'd have to test it, but you know, it's a reasonable assumption. If you think that this gene will come across uh, uh, with a commodity, then the question is, will it establish in our system? And that's with, anti with plant pathogens, that this is where pest risk analysis becomes a little bit more tricky, I think, because if you're thinking of a, a crop coming across, then you've got this sort of, if it's a seed, well then I'm gonna plant the seed, it's gonna go into the agricultural system, it's gonna have that opportunity to establish and then spread. Um, and you look at the environments between uh, the two countries and say, yes, the situations are similar. There's no reason to think that this pathogen or pest won't establish uh, and perpetuate for a certain period of time. So in the IPPC, there's the idea of perpetuation as the, as the rule for establishment. Not so much spread, but it will, it will stay in the system for long enough. It will be viable. And you know, with antimicrobial resistance genes, you'd have to look at the environment where it came from and where it's going to and sort of work out if it would survive in that system. And, and that might be quite a complicated assessment because you need to know what the organism is now and you need to know the, the sort of environment which this organism could inhabit and how it would then establish itself. You know, maybe that establishment, where is that establishment happening? Where is that commodity landing in the UK? And, and then sort of the waste from those farm systems or the orange peel if it goes into the human, if you buy the oranges in, the, in your supermarket and then you peel the oranges and they go into your waste, it gets collected, you know, how does that antigen start to circulate within our environment and establish? So it's quite a complicated one there. And then once you sort of, if you, if you satisfy that it will enter and that it will not just disappear because the environment isn't suitable, you then have to think about, well, how will it spread? And this is the other sort of a criteria for pest risk analysis, which you have aphids, which will carry the virus. You have fungal spores, which will blow. But with antimicrobial resistance, again, it's slightly more nuanced as, as to how antimicrobial resistance moves within our, our, our systems because they're not carried by, um, perhaps in the same conventional ways as, as a pathogen is. You know, we need to think about the, the primary vehicles by which uh, antimicrobial resistance moves between farm systems or crop systems or even sort of homes and, and how that, that antimicrobial resistance gene would prev become prevalent within our system. So that becomes a little bit more, more, more difficult to think through. So what are the factors of spread? You know, in plant health, we have our hosts and our non-hosts, but what are the, the equivalent of a host and a non-host in antimicrobial resistance genes uh, and organisms? And then there's uh, the elements of harm, which have been associated, uh, talked about just uh, recently about how uh, will this gene create more harm than, uh, than existing practices do. So what, if it spreads, will it at least an increase in animal human diseases? To what extent will um, AMR and organisms be pathogenic to existing management practices? So if we have management practices that are controlling for these diseases in livestock, that are already equivalent then and working. Uh, and this gene comes in and will be managed by those, those management practices, then perhaps there's nothing so to be concerned about. So you have to look at the impact this gene will have on our systems uh, if it were to become established and whether the consequences of that. So that's again the sort of final layer of the pest risk assessment. And then the final slide is just these last sort of four areas of PRA which has been alluded to too. With pest risk analysis, you has a, uh, we try to measure our uncertainty. Uh, and obviously with antimicrobial resistance and the sort of the areas which I just mentioned there, there's a lot of uncertainty with, an, with antimicrobial resistance genes and how it will play out in our agricultural system. So there's that uncertainty is, the, the PRA starts to structure that uncertainty and then it starts to identify the gaps and the research gaps, which is very useful when it comes to sort of prioritizing what research we do and how we then go to get the, the funds for those research. PRA also then starts to build what management practices can be applied, which uh, might lead to a regulation and how that is evidence-based and the, the cost benefit of that practice. And the final part of a PRA is the communication piece in that the end outcome of the pest risk analysis is a document which you then put on the tables of people that you need to influence. So it's, it's a very concise way, probably much more concise than this talk, 
about how you would then present the case on trying to put in, in place control measures for pest risk analysis for a particular uh, antimicrobial gene. So that's just a real sort of fly through what pest risk analysis is and an attempt to see if it would work in context of antimicrobial resistance. And I'm not wedded to the idea that it does or doesn't, but I just thought I'd share it with you as a concept today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julian, for this uh, nice concept. Uh, and, and now we open the floor for discussion. Uh, and maybe if there are some online questions, we, sh we should try to, to see if we can take uh, the questions also from the ones that are connected uh, with us, if possible. I don't know, via the chat or... But if there is a question in the audience, please feel free to ask. Marco, maybe you... Thank you so much. Um, yes, uh, thank you for the opportunity also to ask the question. I mean, from the pesticide residue side, I would clearly now sum up that we need the gene, we need to control uh, the, uh, or monitor at least, the antimicrobial resistant genes throughout the food chain. However, I believe we also, from the res residue part, I mean, we would look at the antibiotics present. So we have two issues, mm -hmm. and maybe a third one, maybe also the living bacteria who may also uh, interact. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I didn't consider the residues. That's because I'm not a pesticide person. <laughs> 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 yeah. Thank you very much. Maybe Margot, you can go and and look if there is uh, in the chat someone willing to ask or raise a point. It's very difficult for us just to be on both sides, but I think it's very important also to to keep connected with the ones that are online. Okay, there is no question. Then uh, at this stage we have a coffee pause and we are a little bit later, so that's perfect. So we will now uh, stop and we reconvene uh, uh, at uh, 10.40 uh, for the follow-up of the session. Thank you very much to all the presenters this morning. Uh, very interesting. Thank you also for those who raised questions or triggered the debate. And of course, please enjoy uh, this coffee pause and we will have the possibility to chat all together. Thank you very much. We have you with us and, and uh, we are very pleased that you are participating sometimes from uh, far away and uh, some of you have probably uh, uh, been uh, waking up quite early in the morning just to attend. Uh, so we start now with a presentation by Marie Verhagen on the antibiotic resistance in plant pathogenic bacteria. And this is the, the part of the project uh, that Marie is handling. The floor is yours, Marie. Okay, so good morning, everybody. I'm Mary Vargan, and I'm doing a PhD in UC Louvain in Louvain-la-Neuve. And today I will present you a part of my work, uh, which is entitled Antibiotic Resistance in Plant Pathogenic Bacteria. Uh, so this is uh, kind of the following of the presentation of Claude Praga from this morning uh, on the Plantibio project. So as you know, uh, plant pathogenic bacteria, or PPDs, Causes, causes uh, devastating loss to uh, crops worldwide. Um, and I have represented here some uh, emerging uh, um, uh, issues. So we have, for example, uh, Xylella fastidiosa, which causes the pieces disease, uh, which is threatening the wine industry. And then we have uh, Candidatus uh, liberibacter asiaticus, which causes the uh, citrus green disease, <coughs> which caused the citrus to be uh, misshapen and also uh, bitter, so it cannot be used uh, for sale or even for juices. And then we have Candidatus liberibacter solana serum, <coughs> which also causes the potato to be uh, unsuitable for sale. Uh, so to fight this disease, um, some countries allow the use of antibiotics uh, for PPD control. Um, as you saw earlier, the amount of antibiotic used in uh, plant uh, agriculture is considered to be uh, really low compared to um, veterinary and human medicine. 
However, there is a lack of surveillance data and a recent analysis in antibiotic resistance in plant-associated uh, microbiome have underlined that uh, antibiotic resistance is found in the phytobiome. So uh, this integrates the One Health uh, perspectives. So as you saw, the Plantibio project is divided into three uh, parts. Uh, the first one is uh, about the antibiotic use, then you have the antibiotic resistance, and finally the alternatives and innovative treatments for the control of PPVs. And today I will talk about the uh, antibiotic resistance. Uh, so just to give you a little bit of context of how uh, the, we established the search methodology for the scientific literature. First, we selected uh, seven key reviews that uh, have to be retrieved by our research um, in the databases later to assess the, the relevancy of the keywords that we chose. So for the search of publication through the databases, we followed the PICO uh, model. So it consists of uh, creating a, a question that answers the objectives of the project. Uh, and it contains four elements. So we have the population of, of interest, the intervention, intervention, which is the action of interest here. Uh, sometimes we can add the comparison, but it is not uh, mandatory, and we also have the outcome. So here this model helped us to write the, the question, does the use of antibiotics in plant agriculture affect uh, the prevalence of antibiotic resistance in plant pathogenic bacteria. And we could say uh, compared to uh, no treatment, so no antibiotic. Uh, so this uh, question help us to translate, will be translated into relevant keywords and will result then in an appropriate number of articles. And after the search for publication, we will uh, select uh, some of them uh, through a process that I will explain just uh, in the next slide. Then uh, the reliability will be assessed. And finally, the extraction and uh, summarizing of the data. So here for the question that, that we have established, uh, the keywords that we chose to translate the question are represented here. And you can see on the right of the slide that it is very important to choose uh, very uh, carefully the keywords because otherwise we, are, we have a very huge amount of uh, articles that came, come up uh, in the database. So you can see in the end with all of these uh, keywords, we have one more than 1,000 uh, articles and then we selected them uh, and reduce the number to 42. So to select uh, the uh, articles of interest, we have established some uh, inclusion criteria and exclusion criteria. So for the inclusion uh, criteria, we have um, the publication must be relevant to uh, antibiotic application in plant agriculture. It must focus on a PPB and it must address uh, antibiotic resistance. And for the exclusion criteria, we have uh, in indirect application of antibiotics, so everything that is about uh, manure, sewage, sludge, water, etc. We also have plant pathogenic fungi and fungicide. We have antibiotic resistance in livestock, aquaculture, or etc. Uh, everything that is about alternative treatments, and finally the efficacy of antibiotics. Then to assess the reliability of the, all the papers that we got from the database, we use the SIMAGO tool, which gives a score, uh, allowing us to appraise the quality of the journal. And finally, we also use a combined expertise to filter out some uh, unreliable publication. So I will now uh, dive into the results. And first I will present uh, the antibiotics that are used uh, in PPB control. So the main antibiotic use is streptomycin. We then have oxytetracycline, which is um, used mainly when there is resistance to streptomycin. 
We then have a, a third group with casugamycin, oxalinic acid, and uh, gentamicin, which is uh, which are relatively uh, n low, uh, not very n in a low use, not very uh, um, not used uh, so much. And uh, among these uh, five uh, antibiotics, we have only casugamycin that is used only in plant agriculture. The other four are used uh, also in plant, uh, uh, no, sorry, in uh, human and um, animal agriculture. Then we have here a fourth group, which uh, contains uh, some uh, molecules that are mainly used uh, in China and in plant uh, agriculture. So we have established this world map by searching uh, scientific lit literature, but also uh, gray literature. So it's um, um, here in uh, gray, we have the countries for which we could not find uh, the information. Then in dark green, we have the countries which uh, officially don't use uh, antibiotics. Then we have in the light green, the uh, antibiotic uh, no antibiotic use, uh, but unofficial information. And then the same, um, the same in orange, the dark orange is the official antibiotic use, and in light orange is the unofficial antibiotic use. So we can see that we have more than 30 countries that are reported to use antibiotics on crops. Um, and there is also really a difficulty to list the countries authorizing the use of antibiotics, as uh, Claude Prega presented this morning. And also one of the main challenges is to assess the quantity of antibiotics that is used because there is only three countries, so New Zealand, um, USA, and India, if I'm not mistaken, that uh, uh, publish the number of uh, antibiotics, well, the amount of antibiotics that they use. So this is really one of the main challenges of this uh, project. So let's now move on to the resistance part of the, this work. I have represented here in the table uh, the resistance genes that uh, are known to exist in uh, PPVs and the antibiotics to which they uh, confer the resistance. And you also have a uh, uh, on the on the right, the type of resistance. So, either uh, the acquisition uh, one gene that is acquired, or a point mutation in a gene uh, already present in the chromosome. And in particular, uh, the STRA STRB um, gene pair uh, is very widespread, even in uh, human and animal um, pathogens. And you can see on the table on the uh, right that it is uh, found uh, on a particular transposon, which is the TN5393. Uh, so the transposon is able to be um, to move uh, from uh, one bacteria to another thanks to uh, its plasmid, the plasmid on which it is found. And you can see that there is also a variety of plasmids. And they could, uh, they can either be able to uh, do uh, be horizontally transfer or not. So this really shows the um, potential spread of these antibiotic resistance genes, uh, because when the plasmid is able to be horizontally transferred, then it can be uh, exchanged between bacteria and uh, can uh, spread really easily. And you can also see in the table, for example, that we have one uh, uh, at the bottom, Salmonella enterica, which is a human pathogen on which the trans in which the transposon is also found. So this really shows the uh, widespread occurrence of uh, these genes. Okay, so here I have synthesized uh, in this table uh, all the resistance uh, antibiotic resistance cases uh, that I know of that are reported in the scientific li literature. And you can see that streptomycin is the antibiotic for which uh, they are the most uh, re uh, case reporting. 
and uh, antibiotic resist uh, resistance was found in 18 countries. Uh, for the other four antibiotics, uh, you can see that there is very few um, uh, uh, resistance reports. So I will now show you uh, different maps. And for um, the understanding of these maps, in the uh, color you have uh, the use of antibiotics, and when there is the dots, uh, it's the report of resistance, and if it's the two combined, so the color and the dots, it means that there is a use of this antibiotic and uh, the resistance was reported in this country too. So, um, and also you have the tables, uh, the part of the table relative to this antibiotic. So uh, for gentamicin, you can see that there is only one um, case reported. So, I mean, it's not really representative of the gentamicin resistance probably. Uh, so there is only one report in China, and the places where uh, gentamicin is used do not correspond with the places where the uh, resistance uh, was reported. And for uh, oxidator, uh, sorry, oxolinic acid, uh, there was only two countries where the resistance was reported, but it is two countries that use um, uh, oxolinic acid. Then uh, you have on the left uh, oxytetracycline. Um, and the resistance report uh, occurs in countries where oxytetracycline is used or not. Uh, for example, Brazil, you can see that uh, it is not uh, recorded as a user of uh, oxytetracycline. However, this publication is from 19, the resistance report is from 1994 or 97, so it's pretty old, so maybe we could think that oxytetracycline was used in the past uh, in Brazil. This is really something that we have to look into, and this is another um, uh, challenge uh, of this project, is that the legislation is changing uh, quite rapidly, so maybe it would be interesting in this case to look back and see if the uh, oxytetracycline was authorized in the past. And then on the right, you have the map for casigamycin, and uh, we can see that the resistance reports uh, occurs when countries, uh, in countries where casigamycin is used. Okay, so now here is the map for streptomycin, which is a little bit more complex because there is uh, the most uh, uh, number of uh, resistance uh, report cases. Uh, you can see in the table that I have put in bold the countries that uh, use uh, antibiotics, uh, this antibiotic, and so in total 78% of the resistant case, cases were reported in countries where the streptomycin is used on planes. And so the, um, this map was uh, completed with additional information. We um, took the sequence of the genes uh, conferring streptomycin resistance, and we uh, used BLAST to uh, carry out an analysis in order to look for uh, other, um, the same sequence of the resistance genes in uh, maybe other uh, organisms. So we selected only genera of uh, plant pathogenic bacteria, and we blasted the genes of streptomycin resistance against uh, this uh, nucleotide database. And we found that um, isolates of bacteria in Russia, Reunion, and Nigeria have a very similar um, sequence in their genome than a coding gene for a streptomycin. So this gives an indication that maybe they might be resistant to streptomycin too. Obviously, this is uh, only a bioinformatic analysis, so it is necessary, well, it is only predictive, so it is necessary to uh, check this information uh, with lab experiments. And so I want to show you with this table um, how we synthesize the data that we obtained from the BLAST analysis. So for example, here is the um, table that we obtained with the AADA1 gene, so it confers uh, streptomycin resistance. 
we only looked for um, gene uh, nucleotidic sequence with at least 85% of identity. And here you can see I, I reported the bacterial species and the origin of this bacterial species, and the identity percentage, and the accession number uh, of the sequence. And here is how we identify the strain from Nigeria that has a very uh, high similarity with the um, gene conferring streptomycin resistance. Okay, so this brings me to the end of my talk. Um, so just to insist on some key points of this presentation, we saw that the resistance reports often coincide with the antibiotic use, uh, especially for streptomycin, as it is the most documented. However, uh, obviously there is a bias because the studies are mainly made where the antibiotics are used. So it would be probably very interesting to monitor more widely um, the re uh, resistance appearance and mo make more systematic studies. Uh, and especially maybe in Europe, uh, where there is no use of antibiotics in plants, that doesn't mean that we um, shouldn't be careful about the, the appearance of resistance. Then uh, there is also a need for studies about the the link between antibiotic use and antibiotic resistance. So there is a few studies that are arising, but this is really something that uh, needs to be um, more important. Um, also, we cannot forget the influence of other potential factors because uh, the application of antibiotics on plants is not the only way that antibiotics could end up on plants. We also have the application of manure if the animal was treated with antibiotics. We also have uh, the sewage sludge, sludge, the irrigation water, and also the application of copper because very often there is a cross resistance between copper and uh, another antibiotic. Uh, let's not forget also the impact on the whole microbiome. We have touched a little bit about this subject already, but this is really something also to look into because beyond the plant pathogenic bacteria, the plants, the plants carry other, many other bacteria that could also um, serve as a reservoir of uh, antibiotic resistance genes and transfer of these antibiotic resistance genes. And finally, to complete this uh, research, uh, we will still uh, search over a governmental uh, organization and grey literature for information about resistance managing and also what are the alternatives we could use and if antibiotics are used, how can it be done uh, with limiting the risk of resistance. So thank you very much for your attention and I really thank all of the collaborators also of this project, so from EFSA and uh, in the uh, Plantibio project. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marie. <coughs> Maybe you triggered some questions in the audience. There, there is a microphone, so we will give you the microphone for those who are online. This is Melanie Ivey from Ohio State. Uh, did you just screen the data, the GenBank for the AAD, or did you also look at the other uh, genes for streptomycin mm -hmm. resistance. Yes, I did for STRA, STRB, and AADA1 genes. So these are the main genes for streptomycin resistance. And we will be looking for the other resistance genes to other antibiotics too. Hmm. Okay, yes, there is a question over there. John Threlfall, thanks very much for that very interesting talk. Just one point I'd like to make with your slide you put up of resistance mechanisms. You mentioned oxalinic acid being a point mutation. In fact, it is plasmid mediated as well by the QNR genes. So mm -hmm. it can be whether that will affect your um, overall risk assessment. I don't know, but it, it is quite a common mm -hmm. resistance mechanism to it. Yes, yes, you make a very good point. That's uh, very important. Thank you. Okay. If there is no more question at this stage, um, maybe we will shift to the next presentation by Melanie Ive from Moyo State University. And we will enter into the uh, practical 
management. Uh, so the, the title of the talk is Monitoring and Managing Streptomycin Resistant Erwinia amylovora and Epiphytic Bacterial Population in All Your Apple Orchards. Thank you very much. The floor is yours. Okay. Well, thank you. And we are going to switch gears and um, look at more of the applied research that we're, done, we're doing to try and help producers in Ohio and actually in the U.S. Uh, the work that I've done has been done in other states as well um, to help them manage uh, fire blight, which is probably the most devastating disease to impact apples in the U.S., and the reason for that is because we don't have resistance, host resistance, and also uh, bacteria are just so challenging to manage in general in any crop. Is it this one? Or maybe this one. Oh, there. Okay, so I'm a true plant pathologist, so you're going to see a disease cycle here. This is a picture of an apple in a local grower's orchard with fire blight. And uh, the bacteria Merwinia amylovora uh, moves through the, the plant via the flowers. And so when the population on the stigma of the flowers gets high enough, they then move down into the nectary and they cause a systemic infection. So once you have fire blight, you pretty much have it for life in the tree and you have to then go into managing uh, outbreaks of it. And Erwinia has an epiphytic lifestyle for the most part. So it's in the tree, it's not causing an issue until it reaches a threshold on the stigma of around 10,000 or more cells. And then when you have an environment that's conducive, so warm and a rain event, those bacteria get washed down into the nectaries and cause infection. And so it moves from the, the epiphytic phase to the pathogenic phase once it reaches this threshold of around 10,000 cells on uh, the plant stigma. And fire blight has multiple phases. So we have holdover cankers, and then there's a, the flower or spur blight phase, then there's the shoot blight phase, and there's the rootstock phase. And so all of them have to be managed a little bit differently, and it's the point of entry into the flowers that we focus on for with antibiotics, and that's where antibiotics are applied. And so you can also have uh, biocontrols, although we don't rely on them because they have to be applied so frequently. And so there's a lot of research going on to try and identify, and I'll show a little bit of that, of new novel strains of Pseudomonas that could be used for biocontrol. But there's so many criteria and challenges with using them that it's actually very difficult. And so right now our recommendation in Ohio and across the US is you know, to integrate the biocontrols. But really, if you, if you don't use antibiotics, you're probably not going to uh, gain control, unfortunately. And so we've heard this several times. These are the three main antibiotics that are used. Uh, streptomycin uh, actually kills Erwinia. Kasugamycin uh, is, does not kill it, it's biocidal, and oxytrestrocyte clean as well. And those are the main products that we use. And in terms of efficacy, streptomycin, because it actually kills, it also has a little bit of kickback a couple days within the flower. And so you can um, get the most effective control with streptomycin. Kasugamycin is also very good. It's very expensive, and it's the reason why most of the growers aren't using it. So when Marie talked about its usage not being very much, it actually has to do with the cost more than the efficacy of it. It's also light sensitive, and so producers have to put it on at dawn or dusk, and you know that doesn't work well with their with their spray programs in general. Their people want to go home before uh, it gets dark out. And then oxytetracycline is uh, relatively inexpensive, and again, it's used if we see resistance to streptomycin, then they'll come in with oxytetracycline. One of the interesting things about streptomycin is on the label, it actually says that you should not use it in an orchard where you have animals uh, feeding or grazing, and that has 
specifically to do with the transfer, potential transfer of resistance genes. And we do have quite a few um, growers in our, we call it our plain community. So they're um, Amish or Mennonite growers and they use hogs to graze in the apple orchards to clean up. And so if you're using streptomycin, they're, it's not recommended. And we also heard about the mechanisms, so I'm not gonna spend much time on this, um, but you have basically an alteration of the, the uh, ribosomal protein, which renders uh, the antibiotic uh, useless, pretty much. And you also have enzymatic degradation, and then you have your effluxes, so reduced uptake or, or kick out of the, of the antibiotic. And interestingly, recently there's been genetic linkages um, between streptomycin resistance and other antimicrobials, um, which is a concern, and there's a considerable gap in knowledge there of you know, how those linkages work. So in the United States, this is where we have streptomycin resistance reported uh, in the West as well as the East. I'm gonna show you the data for Ohio that was recently added to the map, not because it's new, but because it was the first time when I joined OSU, the first time when we actually looked for resistance and that had a lot to do with um, major failures in 2018 of um, control of fire blight. In the West, the resistance is mostly due to that RS, uh, that RPSL gene, so that point mutation in codon 43, um, and that is uh, that resistance is there permanently. Where I'll show you in the East, we have the SCRA, STRB, which is specific to streptomycin, and it's transient. Um, so we, we sometimes see it and we sometimes don't see it where the stable resistance with our RSP um, is a real problem in the West. So uh, my student Alejandra Jimenez, who's now a PhD and she's at Mississippi State University now, she did this survey. Uh, we get what are called hatch funds at US, uh, in the US for our land grant universities and so this was um, funded through hatch grant to um, basically to assist growers and identify mitigation strategies for those that have streptomycin resistance. And so we surveyed, there are 88 counties in Ohio. It's a big state. It takes around four hours to go from the south to the north, maybe, maybe bigger than Belgium. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> um, and so we, we surveyed the major apple producing counties um, in, in the state. And we went into to orchards that had a history of fire blight. We tagged those trees and then we did isolations and screened for resistance. It's not actually that easy getting fire blight out of, or Arwinia out of a fire blight um, infected tree. And so it took a little bit of work. The flowers basically die so quickly that you, there's nothing living, so you can't get it out. So we have to go in wait for that little bit of systemic movement into the twig um, to get it out. And then we screened, we just did a, a rapid bioassay where we screened against different concentrations, anywhere from you know no streptomycin up to 2,500 micrograms per mil. And so we first initially did the bioassay, um, then we pulled out all of the ones that were resistant, and then we, uh, we um, sequenced the RPSL and looked for that point mutation, and then we also just did um, uh, STRA, STRB specific PCR. You need to have both STRA and STRB present in order to have resistance, so you have to actually do the PCR for, for both of them, although we did identify some anomalies in there. And so what we found was that we actually had very very little resistance, which was good for the growers, except for those that had it, but it, it helped us develop a baseline for resistance in the state so that we can then track it. And also we've been working on a rapid surveillance technique so that we can monitor resistance in real time, which is very challenging. Um, fire blight, if you're not familiar with it, you basically need a perfect storm. And so some years you might not see it, in other years, it'll be so bad that you know growers are taking out 
taking out uh, blocks in their orchard as the only method of control. And so we found one highly resistant uh, isolate, which implies that it's the RPSL uh, mutation. Interestingly, though, we did not find that mutation, nor did we find STRA or STRB, which indicates that there's possibly something else at play, um, another mechanism that's at play. What I found really interesting, and what we've also found in New York and in Michigan, they found that the epiphytic population is full of the STRA, STRB uh, resistance genes. And so this just shows you what I just said, that we found STRA and STRB, and we also found um, one strain, the MLI33219, which uh, was uh, resistant to the 2,500 micrograms per mil, but had neither the codon 43 mutation nor STRA or STRB. So we're working, well, we have started to um, do whole genome sequencing to try and figure out um, what's going on with that one isolate. So here's some of the example, examples of the uh, epiphytic bacteria that were found in the canopy that had resistance to them. So you can see that most of them are uh, Pantoia or Erwinia and uh, are carrying the genes. These don't, aren't causing disease and uh, is, is quite concerning. You can see that you have you know, the potential to alter the, the phylosphere and the, the resistance um, within the population of the tree, and these can move horizontally. So basically what we found in Ohio and they found in, in, other, st in other states where the STRA, STRB gene is most um, predominant is that, it, that it's transient. And we tend to see it after a lot of use of uh, streptomycin, like many years, five or more is what we found in Ohio where we found resistance in the orchards. They had five or more years use of, of streptomycin uh, during the bloom period. But then we don't find it, you know. So the next year you go in and, it, and you're not picking it up. And so, you know, the genes are there, but whether or not that becomes the predominant strain um, is a crapshoot, <laughs> really. And so what that really just tells us is that we have to constantly be managing for fire blight and considering that the resistance population um, is in play. So one of the things that we promote is antibiotic stewardship. And uh, if you've worked with growers, you, you know that it's a constant, they, they are incredibly intelligent and experts and help you, but they also need constant reminding because they, you know, it can be really concerning when you see your whole orchard going down to a pathogen and, you know, that is their livelihood. And so we have to continually be educating them on antibiotic stewardship. And one of the important parts is when to use it and when not to use it, and then also to be rotating uh, different um, modes of action. And so one uh, success story in the East is the use of uh, fire blight uh, risk assessment models. And these are based on um, the temperature and the rain events. And so basically, any temperature above 60 degrees will allow for um, replication of Erwinia, but it's optimal around 70 to 75. Okay, so hold on. Um, uh, what is that, 15 or 16? 14. <laughs> I think <laughs> degrees Celsius. Um, but this model was developed, there's a model for the West and a model for the East, and um, this model is based on the epiphytic potential is the one that we, we recommend. And so it's that when the population of Orinia is gonna transition from the epiphytic phase into the pathogenic phase is where we focus on. And so the model considers the first bloom date, the, whether or not you have a history, so it gives it a score of zero, one, or two, depending on your history in the orchard, the temperature for the epiphytic growth, and then the blossom wedding period. And it puts out this, uh, this graph or this risk uh, model, and it then helps the growers determine whether or not they should spray antibiotics. So it improves the timing of the antibiotic sprays, 
uh, so that they are, you know, only applying it when the risk is moderate to high, and they're not applying it um, when there's low risk, because the antibiotics have to be applied on a three to five day schedule, and that's just incredibly frequent. And so if they can just reduce a couple of the applications, they're not only um, saving themselves money, but they're also reducing the risk of resistance. And so this model is online. They have to have a weather station. Each, each uh, country subscribe, or each county, each state subscribes to it. And there is a fee, but through our land-grant university, we cover the fee for Ohio. And so this is free to Ohio producers. And anybody can access it um, through our Ohio um, link. And then the output is how we base the recommendations. And it's that EIP potential that we look at. And you can see that if it's extreme, we're telling them to put the most effective uh, antibiotics on, which are if they don't have resistance, streptomycin, and if they do have resistance, uh, casumin. Uh, oxytetracycline, um, when you have extreme conditions, just isn't going to be as effective as strep or uh, casugamycin. So the next thing that we've had a really good success with using um, non-antibiotic strategies, which include systemic acquired resistance, using a compound called ActiGuard, and then growth regulators. So what we want to do is slow down the growth of the shoot and thicken the cell walls so that the bacteria can't enter. And so they routinely apply a mixture of ActiGuard and a growth regulator called um, Apogee, which, uh, which um, interferes with gibberella, gibberellin synthesis. And so this work is done at Michigan State University uh, by George Sundin. Uh, we actually, I have a hard time, I'm not allowed to work with fire blight in the field um, because of the risk of our neighboring growers. Um, so any of the work that I do is in the in a greenhouse, which I'll show you um, in a few minutes isn't always ideal. But what this, um, what it does is it thickens the parenchyma cells. And this was kind of serendipitous. They were testing this product, you know, for canopy management and at Michigan State, they found that in in all the test pro, in all the test blocks uh, for canopy management, they didn't have fire blight, and so they looked into this more, and they found that it's thickening these cell walls and not allowing the pathogen to enter. And this is for the shoot phase of of um, of fire blight because antibiotics don't work on the shoot phase. Although growers will you know start to worry and will apply it. And so that's part of the misuse of, of antibiotics is um, having it applied at the wrong stage. And then we use uh, ActiGuard to boost the plant's immunity. So, you know, uh, accurate timing and using risk levels during bloom followed by using these um, uh, plant natural, boosting the natural immunity and then the um, thickening the cell walls has worked really well to control the shoot blight phase. And then the last part is trying to identify novel strategies. And when I say that, it's mostly biocontrols. So we used to be able to use streptomycin or antibiotics in organic, um, for organic farming in the US. And then in around 2013, they took that away. And so basically organic producers don't have a lot of options. And so a lot of work is going into trying to identify biocontrols. The problem is that they work great in the lab, but they don't work so great once you get into the field. And so we've been screening um, in collaboration with our um, bacteriologists, screening various pseudomonads, novel pseudomonads that have been isolated from different production crops in Ohio. And we identified two, well, you can see that there are several that have good efficacy. This is in a lab assay, you know, so they inhibited Erwinia amylivora. And the two that we picked also inhibit Erwinia trichophilia, which is why we selected these, you know, if we can have um, multiple pathogens. And so in the lab, we saw some good, good results. 
Um, so then we wanted to take it to the field. And when I say field, I mean the greenhouse. So we went into the greenhouse and it turns out we learned something about apple trees in the greenhouse. Uh, apple trees need a certain amount of chilling hours. And so we put them in the cooler, then we put them in the greenhouse. They bloom really well, but then you, you basically lost bloom for a year to two years. So you have to put them back in the chilling, you bring them out and they won't bloom, back into the chilling and then you bring them out and they bloom. So they're very finicky. They don't like the greenhouse environment. So it makes it really challenging and then on top of it, we had COVID. So <laughs> this experiment was only done once. It was supported by um, a sustainable egg research grant um, that we got. We sprayed the flowers with our biocontrol or streptomycin. Then we went in and challenged them with Erwinia, and we really didn't see any efficacy. Even with, with the streptomycin, we had 80% incidence. And when we pulled off um, and you know determined the CFU per gram tissue uh, log was quite high, you know, eight. So we weren't seeing any control. But we also didn't have an ideal experiment because of COVID and because we had a hard time getting enough flowers to do enough replicates. So there's still a lot of work to be done. The, the biocontrols that are available are integrated, but we don't recommend using them when there's extreme pressure uh, or extreme risk. So they can be, come in and be used when there's low risk, um, but otherwise um, biocontrols are, are not really an option. There is some recent work coming out of uh, Switzerland and Canada where they're looking at um, different products that uh, increase the immunity of the plant. They've, they've found that um, they're seeing some efficacy with that. So we're always trying to identify alternative strategies, but our goal really is for anybody, any microbial resistance and to be able to not use antibiotics. And, you know, we've heard that there's minor use compared to the animal uh, industry and the human industry. However, it's, it's a major use for our apples. We, like, we cannot grow apples right now unless we have um, antibiotics. And so uh, it's, it's really challenging. And we have to identify alternatives or we have to identify best practices for continuing to use it. And that's everything. <laughs> Thank you very much, yeah. Melanie. And so maybe there are some questions in the audience. Chiro? Yeah, but uh, a question that is, um, okay, maybe more, more for, for you and also for the European colleagues. So uh, if I correctly understood in the US, you have uh, very few weapons against the DNA lover and the uh, antibiotics is one of them. So what about Europe? You were the head of Erwinia in some country and you are not using the Well, so that's really challenging because you can, there are biocontrols that you can put on, but basically what you have to do, and what I understand is being done, is you're managing the other, the other phases because there are five phases to, to fire blight. So making sure that you're using resistant rootstocks, uh, less resistant or, or maybe tolerant varieties, although there's very few varieties, you know, and all of the newer ones are highly uh, susceptible to fire blight. Uh, focusing on those holdover cankers and good canopy management to get rid of those holdover cankers during the dormant season. And then you can also apply copper um, before green tip to, to manage the holdover cankers. Uh, it's just, you know, a lot of other integrated practices, but for us, you know, the conditions, especially in um, eastern U.S., are so conducive for fire blight that um, actually the one picture I show it on there is what happens if you do nothing. Um, so a lot of times they'll say, okay, you know, I'm, I'm just not going to, you know, put any money into this and I'm going to reduce my use of streptomycin and then you end up with an outbreak and uh, it takes a lot to clean up that orchard once you have uh, an outbreak in it. Yeah. <laughs> Julian? Maybe we should, you should, we should use the microphone for those online. <laughs> Sorry. So with the, um, uh, 
the streptomycin resistance that you saw in the Awinia population, but then also in the non-Awinia population. You, so you, you isolate the Awinia from the, the stem, but where did you get the isolates from? Where were you sampling from for the other population? So they came off the flowers and the twig tissue as well. Yeah, so um, we used semi-selective medium, but we got a lot of, of other stuff okay. out of there. So okay. I didn't show that we've also used um, Arwinia amylivora specific primers to confirm that it was Arwinia um, because it's hard to tell the other species in and Pantoya apart. Yeah, so we have over, well, hopefully, we have over a thousand of those epiphytic um, bacteria in collection, but because of the tornado, we have an electricity, so who knows what happened to the collection. <laughs> so. uh, we also have an uh, online question, so I will ask it from uh, Virginia Stockwell. Uh, she asks uh, if you have had success with the yeast blossom protect that was developed in the European un Union. Mm -hmm. So we, our Ohio growers are not using that. So, but I, but maybe you can address the growers here in <laughs> <laughs> in in Belgium. Or, but we, our Ohio growers aren't using it. They're sticking uh, Virginia. They're sticking mostly to uh, George Sundin's recommendations um, for Michigan. Mm -hmm. And it's true that the Blossom Protect is, is uh, authorized for use in Europe and is used uh, in, in with, with the view of controlling fried fire blight, yes. And, so and does it work? It does. Okay, uh, good. Well, but I, I'm, I'm not uh, currently working on the Winnie Amilovora, so I, I really cannot provide uh, some Precisions on, on the level of effecti effectiveness of, of the treatment, but it is something that is used uh, currently. But what, what I would like to say is that maybe the pressure of the disease that we are experiencing, at least of what I know here around in Belgium, is much less than probably what you have or what you have in areas where we have epidemics with fire blights. And maybe this is really the difficulty uh, and the challenging issue with this uh, yeah. bacteria. Yeah, and you know, some years we don't see it at all, and then other years, like this year, was a really bad, bad year for us. But it was because we had an extended bloom period, and so that also creates a problem um, because you use up your usage of streptomycin, and then you know you have to use alternative methods, and that extended bloom period is a real problem. And we're seeing a lot more of that with. Um, climate change, that we see our bloom period going on much longer than, than it used to. Okay, thank you very thank much, you. Uh, Melanie, and thank you also for traveling so far away <laughs> to give this talk in person. Uh, this is highly appreciated. Okay, so the next talk will be given by Dr. Cécile Bolland, which is the head of bacteriology lab uh, at Cienzano, and uh, the title of the talk is AMR, uh, array for the detection of antibiotic resistance in bacteria, an example. And the idea with this talk is to give an, an idea of what is done, but not in plants else, but maybe in animal and human sciences. Please. Thank you. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. It's my pleasure to present to you an array that we developed in my lab um, that could inspire you from your, for your field. <laughs> I hope so. So it is the AMR array. It's a modular bead array, uh, which is able to detect um, resistance determinants to beta-lactam, fluoroquinolone, cholestine, aminoglycoside, and macrolides in gram-negative bacteria. So as you know, antimicrobial resistance is a major current issue. The monitoring of this resistance is one of the important pillars of national action plans against uh, antimicrobial resistance. It is important to add genetic data to the official IMR, uh, EMR monitoring, which is mainly based on uh, phenotypic susceptibility, um, in different aims, uh, among others, to identify uh, the mechanism of co or cross selection and to assess the transferability potential. Um, such arrays are faster and cheaper than conducting uh, several PCRs. 
They are cheaper than commercial kits and the panel of targets can be customized according to your needs. So you can choose to, to use the entire panels, uh, panel of targets or to select only the, the ones that are the more interesting for you and th thereby decreasing the cost. Uh, the AMRA can provide added value compared uh, to whole genome sequencing uh, for the screening of large collections of bacteria. Because it's a fast and cheap alternative targeting the most circulating resistant genes and it can be used as a screening tool. The other advantage is that it's an open access uh, tool. So the aims of this particular array were to target the most common antimicrobial resistance determinants against beta-lactam, fluoroquinolone, cholestine, macrolides, and aminoglycosides in Enterobacteria C, uh, especially in uh, E. coli, Shigella, and Salmonella. Um, it was assessed on f uh, bacteria from food producing animals, from the food chain, and from human samples. Let's now have a look at the methodology that can be used for other targets also. <laughs> so it's a multiplex uh, assay based on a ligase chain reaction. I will show you this in more details afterwards. And the detection is performed on a bead array hybridization platform uh, commercialized by Luminex. It can detect in theory uh, up to 80 genetic markers simultaneously and it's sensitive at the single nucleotide polymorphism level, so at the SNP level. It's easily updatable, and you can add so uh, easily new targets if something new is emerging. It's easy to use, and now let's have a look at the ligase chain reaction in theory, and then I will show you some pictures from the lab to help you to visualize the technique in the lab also. So uh, the probes that we developed ourselves are particular because um, th so th th we call them part, uh, padlock probes because of their shape. So uh, these are single-stranded uh, oligonucleotides that are at the beginning of the reaction linear. So uh, the five prime end is phosphorylated to enable the ligation. And at the three prime end, there is uh, the nucleotide corresponding to the SNP, if you are targeting a SNP, or to the middle of your sequence, if you are targeting a gene. So the T1 and T2 are more or less 20 uh, nucleotides each, and they are adjacent and will be ligated if these, uh, at total, uh, 40 nucleotides are in um, the DNA of the, the samples that you are investigating. There are also two uh, uh, parts of the sequence of our probe that are dedicated to universal primer to enable a PCR amplification uh, to have an enhanced signal afterwards. And the last part of the, of the probe is a tag corresponding to bees uh, pre-coupled uh, with anti-tags that, uh, uh, that are commercialized by Luminex. So, Let's have a look now at the LCR itself. So at the beginning of the reaction, uh, you add a cocktail of probes and add the ligase and the DNA of your strain. Um, if uh, the target is present in your, in your bacteria, uh, the probe will be ligated. And uh, so at the end of, of the first step, you, would, you get a circular probe, uh, which is ligated. The second step is a degradation with an, an exonuclease to uh, remove all the unligated probes and the template DNA. Um, and the last step is uh, the, a PCR amplification of all the ligated probes with a uh, primer um, uh, coupled with the fluorochrome uh, cyanine 3. And so at the end of uh, the LCR reaction, you have a classical PCR product uh, that is present only if the marker was present in your strain at the beginning. And now, just have a look in the lab uh, how it, do it looks like. Uh, so this assay is in a, a PCR plate. Uh, so you have only a few tubes to mix uh, and to add the DNA for the first step for the, the ligation. And it's just to, to show you that the theory could seem complicated for the first time, but then in the lab it's easy. It's just reaction in thermocycler. 
and afterwards you keep the same plates and add a volume with the mix of the um, the exonuclease enzyme and you <laughs> put it again in the thermocycler and the last step is in the same wells you add um, the PCR reagents and get the final LCR products. Uh, you can store uh, this in minus um, 20 degrees uh, uh, to, to do the hybridization afterwards if you want or directly if you have time to do it the same day. So now the detection platform, it's a Luminex platform. And so uh, it's an, uh, to, to detect them on, on this platform, you first need to hybridize um, the LCR products with the uh, uh, beads uh, coupled with the anti-tags corresponding to your um, probes. And so whenever it's hybridized, uh, the reading is um, in the Luminex machine, which is like a flow cytometer. And so there are two lasers, two different lasers. One is uh, detecting the bead color, the, the red color of the bead. So each bead has, are, has a specific red color. And so it's to identify uh, which bead is being, reading, being read. And uh, the other laser is interrogating if there, were, if there, there was uh, probes hybridized to this particular bead. And so if there is a probe hybridized, it means that the marker was present in your bacteria strain. So now in the lab, um, the beads are magnetic, so you can um, resuspend it at the right concentration by pelleting the beads on the magnet and removing supernatant. And mix, we mix uh, this mix of beads with the LCR product. And then the hybridization is in the thermocycles um, at uh, 37 degrees during 13 minutes. And afterwards, we, we conduct three washes. Uh, we, we wash the beads uh, by pelleting them uh, on a magnetic uh, plate. And we move the supernatant by phosphor inversion. And we, we, we do it uh, three times and we suspend it, uh, the beads at the end uh, in a hybridization buffer. And then with the, um, the things in the Illuminix machine. So now uh, um, let's have a look at the raw data analysis. So um, the raw data are median fluorescence intensity. So they are exported from the machine in a CSV format and it can be opened in, in an Excel file. And we have um, coded, uh, uh, we have created a template uh, that is not easy to use. And uh, we code it uh, the macro with visible basic uh, for application. And so uh, in each um, well, there is an internal uh, control, which is a probe targeting uh, the 16S of the enterobacteria C. And so it enables to normalize the signal in each well. And so the signal of each probe is divided by the signal of this enterobacteria C probe and multiplied by 100. And thereafter in the Excel file, uh, you get something like this. So for each line, each line is a strain and the different columns are the different probes. And uh, we compare the things with uh, a lower and a, an upper threshold. And um, it enables to give you a positive and negative signal for each probe. So positive are in green and negative in, uh, in red. So at the end, you have a genetic profile of your strains and it's visual, <laughs> the results. Let's have a look at the mix of, uh, uh, of probes present in this array. So we have three different control probes. One if is uh, the to normalize the signal, so the enterobacteria C probe. And the two others are to identify the salmonella species and the E. coli species. And then thereafter, there are different probes are getting either genes or mutation. So it could be also used for other <laughs> application, as I see um, before in the, the presentation this morning. And so the genes are in yellow and the mutation in blue, but I will not go in detail uh, here. If you want, you can have detail afterwards. Um, and so these are targeting uh, beta-lactam resistance determinant, uh, the one coding for the e ESBL, OMC, or carbapenemase phenotypes, um, fluoroquinolone, cholestine, and macrolide and aminoglycosides. What is interesting for you uh, especially is, for example, that we have uh, 
two probes targeting um, a nucleotide in the GA. So one is the wild type uh, sequence of GA, and the other is targeting the, uh, the GA uh, 83 um, codon, uh, which is encoding a, a leucine. So I don't know if it's uh, exactly the same for you, but so this probe exists. <laughs> uh, and it's in, in our case, it's to detect the resistance to fluoroquinolone that it's used. Uh, there are also other probes for aminoglycoside resistance, but I don't, I, I don't know if it's the same uh, uh, resistance marker that are circulating in the plant bacteria, but the concept exists. All, all probes uh, needed can be developed afterwards with the same methodology. Um. And so in our array, we have a 53 plex, uh, so 53 probes in a single mix and it's a high level of multiplexing, and in our knowledge, it's quite unique, um, uh, such multiplexing. So then we uh, compared uh, our array with uh, reference methods, and we did the analysis at three levels. Uh, firstly, we compared the phenotype, so the both mi microdeletion uh, uh, results with uh, the results of our array. Uh, secondly, we compare the array with other um, arrays available and with uh, the results of PCR tests. And lastly, we compare the results of the array with the results of whole genome sequencing. So let's be first begin with um, the comparison with the phenotypes. Uh, we did it with several uh, categories of isolates. The first one was um, nine uh, strains resistance to carbapenems that were provided by the European Reference Laboratory of Antimicrobial Resistance. And uh, we found a carbapenem resistance marker in all of them with the array. We investigated uh, 124 food isolates, uh, and we found uh, a concordance of uh, between 93% and 100%. Uh, and um, we uh, also investigated uh, isolates from food producing animals, and um, the concordance was lower, uh, was quite low for uh, the MC phenotype. Uh, um, a little bit, uh, it was higher for azithromycin resistance, 88% of concordance, but for all the other phenotypes, for the quinolone, the gentamicin resistance, the colistine resistance, and the ESBL phenotype, the concordance was uh, higher than 95% between the marker detected by the array and the phenotype. Um, and so in total, we assessed the, the phenotypes of, uh, we assessed 904 phenotypes, and 95% of them were uh, concordant with our array. Let's have a look now at the comparison with the uh, PCR and other microarrays. Uh, we found a resistance determinant, uh, we found all but one <laughs> resistance determinant, so it was pretty good uh, concordance. And we compare also uh, the with the whole genome sequencing on a connection of uh, 104. Uh, 39 E. coli from animal origin. We assessed, uh, we compared uh, the results for 702 resistance determinants. It was either SNPs or genes. And we found a selectivity of 99.3% and a specificity of 100%. So it gave very good results, these comparisons. So here are uh, the conclusion and some message that you, you may take home with you. Uh, such arrays are useful to get a genetic data on the uh, antimicrobial res resistance of large collections of isolates. This is a good screening method. Um, it enables to, to choose uh, which uh, isolates are the most interesting to sequence, for example, for example, only uh, when you compare the phenotypes and the results of the array, if there is a discordance between these, if you don't find any markers uh, of resistance with the array, it's really interesting to sequence these isolates. While if the, the isolates uh, carries the most frequent genes, it doesn't matter to have the, the entire sequence. Uh, so it, it gave good performance compared to whole genome sequencing. Uh, we um, achieved a high level of multiplexing. This, uh, such arrays are modular, adaptable, and upgradable, so you can choose whatever XPlex 
you want, depending on, on your specific study. And you can choose also new probes. Uh, it detects single nucleotide polymorphisms, And it's easy to generate quick results at competitive cost per sample. And the methodology is open access. And if you want more details, um, this was recently published in the Journal of um, Microbiological Methods, and it's an open, so, uh, open access paper, so you may have a look at this. And this methodology was already uh, used to other targets in our lab, so we developed uh, similar arrays to uh, identify and characterize monophasic variants of Salmonella tifimogam. And uh, the same approach was used, but with a detection under the capillary electrophoresis for the identification of, uh, of uh, Brussels species. And we have another array uh, that is um, for which the paper is under writing um, to target the AMR determinants in uh, gram positive bacteria. And so, my question for you is why not customize an array for AMR detection in plants? I think the same methodology could be useful for your fields. I want to thank you all for your attention and all the people that fund it and participate to this project. And especially, I have to thank Michael Timmermans, who was the PhD student working on this project. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cecile, uh, to give us uh, an overview of what is ongoing in, on the other side of <coughs> animal and human health. Uh, and it's nice to see this multiplex approach uh, targeting resistance. Maybe there are some questions in the audience or on, on the web. Melanie? We will, yes, we will give you a microphone. So how long does it take? <laughs> I guess I, for, I forgot to, to you put You said it. it was quick, but how long is quick? <laughs> OK, you're right. Uh, so, so if you are really under, uh, behind your time cycle or waiting for uh, the end of the, each step, uh, it's uh, uh, less than uh, eight hours. But just, yeah, uh, if, you're, if you have only one sample and go very quick, but it, it's classically one day for the LTI reaction. If you are a PhD student, you can do the, <laughs> the Luminex the same day. <laughs> uh, so it's one between one and one day and one and a an half, I would say. Uh. And, and can you use it with plant tissue, or does it only work with pure cultures? We uh, use it on a pure culture of uh, bacteria, but. Um, it was also tested with bold, um, you, you know, uh, it was tested once <laughs> to take uh, one colony on a plate and put it directly in the, in the reaction uh, without um, DNA extraction. Um, but we did not test it on tissue. I don't know, it depends on the limit of the detection. In fact, yeah, the, the method is really good, but on, on Pure isolates. I'm not sure the level of detection is enough uh, if you are working with raw material, but it has to be tested. Maybe it works. It depends on the sh on the charge of uh, what you are searching for. Julian. So kind of related. How many samples could you get through in a day? Um, Can it be high throughput? Easily, easily, you can have uh, 196 plates. Uh, in theory, you can uh, do more, but we didn't yet try it. I think yeah, one pla 196 plates is good. But and how many samples is that? Is that 96 samples? No. We, we have uh, the minimum uh, number of controls is four. So you have 92 uh, samples and the four control. And you have the results of 50, 53, uh, 53 markers for 92 uh, strains. So. Sorry? No, no, you, you have a single plate, and for in each well, you have 53 results. <laughs> The longer step, in fact, is to add each DNA in at the beginning, but afterwards, uh, everything is the same in is the same mix in all the wells. So it's just to add the DNA of in each uh, 
isolator. So it's about eight hours if you have one single isolator, a little more if you have 96 uh, DNA to, to, to distribute, but it's not that long. Uh. It's uh, faster than several PCR if you want to have 53 uh, <laughs> PCR results. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. You're so welcome, thank you. Very nice. Okay, our last talk will be given by Liliana Hoyos, who is in Colombia now, and who is proposing communication on bacteria in avocado, sensitivity to antibiotics for agricultural use. And she will, she's not online? And so she will, she's, she told me she's online, but of course, uh, and, and we are in a hybrid session, so we will see how to handle this. And Liliana will share our presentation herself. And we hope it will work. So for Liliana, it is uh, 4.45 in the morning. <laughs> Just to <laughs> explain where she is, far away. So thank you very much, Liliana, for proposing this and for waking up early to attend this session. Welcome. The floor is yours. <coughs> so you will be able to share your presentation? Of course. Anything. We don't thank hear you, you so well, but I guess we will. Sorry. Okay, so can you see my uh, presentation now? I think we have my to wait. It is arriving, I guess. Okay. <laughs> I will tell you Thank when you. I see it. Thank you. And suppose that I am sharing you my presentation, so. Yeah, you should share it. Since that is not working, I'm sorry. If it is not working, maybe you can try again. Yes, I'm trying. We see you uh, on the screen. Yes. And uh, I'm open it, but since that I can. Well, I'm sorry. What we can do is uh, try to send by mail to some of you, and I can uh, just begin to tell us about our work to don't delay the program to all of you. Yes, or maybe because may maybe the, the idea maybe is that you explain what you were uh, to present uh, directly without the presentation. Maybe that will be the easiest way. You just speak. We, we see you very well. And you just explain uh, and give your message. Uh, if that's fine for you, I think that will be the easiest. Oh, well, unfortunately, I cannot show you, but I can send you my presentation. But I, to yeah. don't delay the program, I'm going to do. So it's OK for me if it's OK for you. So if you want to send, the, 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 the question is maybe someone uh, can give you an, an email address in the chat, but I'm, I'm not sure this is possible. I'm looking at our experts at, at the back. Uh, OK. So I can, I can begin to explain or to talk about our presentation here. So then, late, uh, share with all of you my presentation, our presentation. Yes. OK. So we are talking about avocado bacterial diseases, which are not common or which are not uh, in the literature. So our presentation is named bacteria and avocados, sensitive 
sensitivity to antivirus from agricultural use. So our project here is um, part of a uh, magister thesis. Uh, uh, well, it's our student is Maria C. Montes. So first of all, I want to tell you that Colombia is a high biodiversity spot in the world. So with uh, only 0.2% of the land area on the planet, we are in the first uh, rank of a lot of uh, species, birds, plants, reptiles, mammals, but we don't know about microorganisms. So, in the case of crops that are growing up because the industry and trade mark are demanded, for instance, avocado, we have new diseases or new symptoms that we should study to control. One of those are bacterial uh, damage or injuries in the pill. So the markets ask to us for a high quality or cosmetic quality on those products. So we know about the usual diseases, Colectotrichum gloesporioides and so on in avocado, but quite often in Colombia, uh, which is humid tropic with a lot of rain, appears a damage of the peel, which causes uh, losses and besides um, can punish the price and markets on avocado. So one of the things that we did was uh, assess for diseases and we found bacteria in this uh, avocado which are not in the previous reports, even in the world. So, let me tell you that in a short and exploratory study, we found 126 strains in 56 morphotypes. When we select 35 present high frequency in both dry and rainy seasons, so we assess um, for pathogenic bacteria, so we perform tests on fruits, leaves, and a sensor plants. We found uh, 14 uh, pathogenic strains. We tried to identify some of uh, all those pathogenic strains with um, biochemical test, metabolic profile, and as well, 68 sequence. Uh, unfortunate, unfortunately, one of those cannot be identified. I, we know that is a gene, a 68 sequence, a, a gene, those are genes, which doesn't allow us to uh, be precise with the identification. And besides, some of them have a, a known sequence. So it's what we get here. Uh, as I told you before, biodiversity is high, and uh, this is a good example, because our sample were few, and we, what we found was a huge surprise for all of us. So this is a project for growers and with growers. So we have two uh, assess the sensitivity of these strains to quite often use it products in uh, pre-harvest and post-harvest to, as, you, as I told you before, to reach the quality that is um, asked in markets. So what we did was use it copper sulfate, copper oxychloride, which are quite common used here to manage plant diseases, as well oxytetracycline. But in in vitro tests, we use this as well chloramphenicol and kenamycin because all of those uh, antibiotics work in protein synthesis, as well tetracycline. So uh, besides we use bacillus, 
a mix of bacillus, amyloliquefaciens and valesensis, because uh, the use in agricultural um, practice are growing up, those bacteria are growing up. And uh, we use it as well fludioxonil and ciprodinil. Those are fungicide molecules. But the problem is that the growers here, and almost everybody speaks about fungal diseases in plant, as a plant pathogenic uh, treatment. But, but the problem is that what we are doing as a plant pathologist, I didn't present myself, I'm an agronomist. So we are looking, we are finding quite often bacterial diseases or bacterial inside of the complex of a disease. So what is important here? Uh, I saw the first presentations and let me tell you that uh, antibiotics are a pesticide group. It is in Fungicide Resistant Action Committee webpage. It's around the world. It's allowed with FAO, it's allowed with uh, the Council of Plant Growing Protection in a lot of countries. And it's labeled as fungicide. But it's not a fungicide, we know it. So, the people in file confuses, is, is in a confusion with, between fungicide and antibiotics. And they don't know even the difference, of course, of a bacterial or a fungal spore. So they use uh, indiscriminately both kind of molecules. So we assess in the bacterial of avocado the sensitivity, sensitivity, I'm sorry, of those uh, groups of uh, molecules and decide biological control uh, compounds or microorganisms of bacillus disease. So what we found here, uh, in a simple test, because we have to use easy applicability and reading cheap, reliable test, and uh, you are going to ask why you don't use PCR to assess uh, antibiotic uh, sensitivity is because when you have to carry to buy, um, uh, I forgot the word, um, products to make PCRs and so on, here could be 10 times more expensive and delay one year at least to bring it here. So we use usual microbiological methods. So we use an old protocol, Kelman protocol, on 1967, believe it or not, but it's still working to assess the sensitivity. What we found was um, in our test, on which I'm sorry, I have to tell you, we used the, the dosage use a recommended for file, and then we go with less and less uh, in a dilution, in, in a three different uh, dosage, less than the dosage file. And uh, what we found was no sensitive, no sensitive or no sensibility to Cooper molecules, Cooper sulfate, Cooper oxychloride. Neither, no, no sensitive to cannabisin, chloramphenicol, and of course no sensitive, no sensitivity to fungicides. What we found in these 14 bacterials, most of them are sensitive, sensitive to oxytetracycline. But what is important here? Oxytetracycline, as a previous um, expositor says before, is cheap. Uh, with uh, not well regulations, growers don't know the difference between a fungicide and antibiotics and the risk. So it's easy to get it. And 
the bacterials around uh, associated to avocado are sensitive to tetracycline. But what is important here? We use this as well in a different kind of test. It's a dual clashes with inhibition radio biological control test to decide the biological control to this other side, the, um, the plant pathogenic bacteria. So we, as, we, as, we were assessing the sensitivity of biological control agents against bacteria. And what we found uh, is all of those were, se were sensitive. Or, or they have sensitivity, were controlled by the bacteria. So it seems that is an option, except, except by the systemicity. What means, or what, what do I mean with sensitivity uh, or systemic movement? Bacterials are inside of the tissues of avocado. Oh, now I cannot show you my presentation. I'm going to show you with a pool. <laughs> I am a professor, so I have to. So this is an avocado, a real one. So we can see the damage outside, but those are not outside, actually. I have a nice picture to show you that the damage goes in or becomes to appear in any of the layers of the avocado. So. Biological control are just outside. They cannot go in as the antibiotic does. So the problem is for our growers that they have a disease, they have a complex disease because there is a lot of microorganisms involved there that we don't know even the identity. And we don't have as a growers or agronomist, an, alter an alternative with systemic movement. So biological control seems to be the most uh, um, reliable option right now, but we have to improve the technology, but we have to improve the knowledge. Bacillus is a bacteria that have quorum quenching uh, molecules. Quorum, quorum quenching, yes, I am right. Quorum quenching are molecules that interrupt the communication among uh, bacterial communities. But we don't know the systemicity, but we have to work with it. Because as I mentioned to all of you, our population seems to be non-sensitive, with no sensibility to some antibiotics except tetracycline, but we don't okay. know, we don't want tetracyclines inside of our fruits, okay. neither the market. Okay, thank you very much, Liana. I, I, I know the, it was quite the challenge to do the presentation with, without your slides. Uh, thank you very much for offering this talk and uh, this overview of uh, new emerging bacterial disease of avocado in Colombia and, and the way you are addressing the problem. And, and the connection also to antibiotic resistance, as you pointed out. So thank you very much for participating. Thank, thank you very much. I know it is very early for you, and so that, that's, that's nice uh, offering this uh, type of communication. I, I feel in, 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 in this topic, we should really network and, and uh, connect uh, all the, the initiatives. So the idea now is to have a, a short round table. It's not it should not be long, but maybe to allow you to, to ask questions or raise some points, ideas that have been triggered this morning. And so maybe I will invite, if they accept, Melanie and uh, Julian to sit here in front of the microphones. And we should have online Giuseppe Stancanelli and uh, Jorge Ferreira. And so <coughs> at least Jorge is there. Uh, and we will uh, try to trigger some uh, interactions. I see Giuseppe is there also. Please. Do you want to stay up there? I can bring a chair. No, no, no please uh, come in. I will just take the microphone. <laughs> in 
maybe, maybe we can start with Giuseppe. And Giuseppe, uh, you are in Parma. Um, after this morning presentations, uh, what is your overall feeling, or what would you, would you like to express at this stage? My feeling is that uh, um, the target of this project uh, is very important. So to collect data at uh, a global level on the use of antibiotics and on antimicrobial resistance, probably the first target is uh, is a, a beginning the the key one. So really to collect data on the usage, and for this I think we can have some good synergies with FAO. But uh, from the talk we have today, it is important to have the feedback from the scientists, from the practitioners, from the national organization, because some of the elements you will find, uh, as shown by, by the colleague by Claude, as some element of uncertainty, because it's done based on translation from labels. Uh, some uh, will not be found, and some uh, but uh, can be retrieved from the experts. So I think it is very important to make use of this project to establish synergies for the data collection on the usage of antibiotics. Uh, and then the main, the seven, then the other question is uh, the how, how I was spread is the antibiotic resistance. Uh, then uh, which are the mechanisms of transfer, the model for transfer from the different compartment in the production system and uh, plant health, human health, animal health environment. So these are bigger questions. So I would be very happy from this meeting we can come up with some synergies for the. Uh, starting from the data collection on the usage uh, for antibiotics. Okay. And maybe Yogi, if if you wish, you raised some points for the uh, the round table uh, and and the parallelism in between human health, animal health, and plant health. Maybe you can just comment on this or react to uh, Giuseppe's comments. Yeah. No. Thank you. Thank you very much. And. and Really, I would like to congratulate you for organizing this this workshop and uh, the meeting itself. I found it really interesting, and the, you you uh, chose uh, speakers ap approaching different topics. And I think, uh, like Giuseppe said, and you also mentioned when we were preparing this presentation, that this is hopefully this is the beginning of collaborations that lead, for example, like Giuseppe said, uh, and we're not that far from Roma to Parma. We can easily connect on uh, how to get better use data on antibiotics. And uh, regarding the presentation, for example, one that the, the um, they were all really interesting. And uh, one point that um, Melanie raised, the risk-based um, application of antibiotics, I found it particularly interesting. We are discussing now, we, we use this term a lot, risk-based approaches, risk-based um, uh, strategies. Uh, and the, the one that she, she presented, like based on the temperature, should the antibiotic be used or not? It's a very good field example of uh, how we can envision and advise uh, um, producers at the field level. Of course, we, what we want is non-use, but if you have to use it to do it uh, on this approach, seemed to me very interesting and something that we could um, think how, how we could uh, promote this kind of approaches. So above all, uh, thank you very much and congratulate to the organization. It was uh, very useful and interesting. Thank you very much. And maybe I will just uh, rebound to Melanie. Um, maybe you want to express the feeling of the farmers and, and uh, uh, the importance for them just to find solutions to these problems, these, these bacterial problems. And if you wish to comment, because I know you have been working quite a lot in the States, but also you have been in touch with Africa or different countries, maybe you can en enlarge your vision on, on, on this. Well, you know, it for the apple or the fruit tree, they, they're used a little bit with peaches and bacterial spot. It's, it's gonna be really challenging if we lose, you know, if we lose our ability to, to um, use antibiotics. And so I think as with, you know, the human side of it and the animal side of it, you know, it's, it's identifying best practices and making sure that you know stewardship is really promoted. Um, I, I find it interesting, you know, that there there's a willingness or a the the idea of taking it away from producers, uh, 
tree fruit producers, but not taking it away from animal producers. <laughs> so, you know, it, I, we use so little of it, but they're so critical um, to that one industry. Um, and I think, you know, we have strict regulations and, and we, most of the growers are, are using them in a way that's recommended and <clears throat> how they're registered. Uh, so I think, you know, one strength that we have in the, in the U.S. is our, you know, through our land-grant universities is our extension. And, you know, we really spend a lot of time um, communicating and, and disseminating information. And I think that's a really a, a strength. Um, I spent a bit of time, uh, we did a survey with the FAO looking at uh, pesticide and antimicrobial use in, in um, Kenya and Tanzania. I think there was one other, I can't remember. I, I went to Kenya. And, you know, the, it, they say that they don't use them for plants, but, you know, they can walk in and, and purchase and purchase them from an agrochemicals store. And then what happens with them after that is, is really not known. So I think it's going to be a challenge in some countries to identify the usage of it. Um, it, it bacteria are hard. <laughs> it's hard to, they're hard to manage. And I don't, I can't foresee being able to manage fire blight without antibiotics right now, unless we have some other, other silver bullet come along. <laughs> I know okay. that probably wasn't very helpful. Okay, thank you. And you, Julian, you, you introduce a very interesting concept. Uh, may, maybe you want to comment uh, after this session or yeah. add some thoughts? So I think one of the things that I thought was really interesting was the, the survey of the countries that were using antibiotics and whether they were seeing resistance emerging. And whether there was mentioned that that was a biased survey in as much as that the countries that are using antibiotics are trying harder to find antibiotic resistance and those that aren't using it aren't looking for it so they're not seeing it. So I think we just need more, more data, more baseline data on the prevalence of where antimicrobial resistance is within our systems and then the association or the, the extent to which there's a smoking gun there with antibiotic use. It's, you know, it's not a, a you know, it's logical that it would be there. Uh, but uh, if we start to get these baselines, then I think we're in a stronger position to start to, to, to move, to progress research ideas, uh, regulatory sort of ideas, uh, conversations and discussions between countries who are using antibiotics and not using antibiotics. The other side, I think, is, is an interesting question, is to what extent are we concerned about uh, antimicrobial resistance to the extent that we would lose the ability to control a disease or we're creating a human health hazard? And I think we have to be a little bit clearer as to perhaps what our intention is here in terms of the study of antimicrobial resistance in plant pathogenic populations as to what it is we want to, to really put across as our message. Is it one about human health or is it one about losing another pesticide uh, efficacy in trade? You know, and, and, and linking to that, there is a massive need globally to be better for better surveillance systems on pesticide resistance in all things to do with pests, fungicides, insecticides, herbicides, etc. You know, we're pretty good at it in the UK and Europe, but we're still far from being very good at it. And uh, with the reduced arsenal that we have in pesticide use, we can't afford to lose many more of these before we run into really serious project problems. So on that side, I think there's a nice conversation to have on pesticide resistance, uh, uh, which might encompass antimicrobial resistance as one of the pesticides, depending on if you classify uh, antibiotics as a pesticide, etc. So it's, it's a really interesting conversation, I think. Yeah, you bring up a good point because the you know food security versus human health. You know, we we need food to survive, um, but then you know at what at what risk or you know what cost does that come? I think that's a really good point, Julian. Okay, and in the audience, some comments or reactions? 
or maybe on the web? Uh, I, I think compared to the uh, application of antibiotics to animal and uh, humans, is there any, uh, I think it's more relevant the aspect of uh, the environmental fate in application in agriculture. So do you think this could represent a threat for humans? The fact that is, uh, of course, is spread, it's not a point application. Yeah, it could well be. I mean, it's, I suppose that's my concern with the, this, the uh, uh, yeah, that was really sort of in studying the gene rather than the organism, I think is, is, is a, a critical question because that would be the fate of, of the antimicrobial resistance in the environment and where that goes through to and the risks, risks associated with that. And you know, the point of, the point of uh, uh, antibiotics applied to livestock systems, which is very sort of targeted, as you say, and specific to the, to the, to the livestock compared to a spray system. It looks very different, doesn't it? But I guess we just don't know. I don't, well, I don't know uh, to the extent to which that presents a risk, uh, a bigger risk. Yeah, there, you know, there's quite a few studies where we've, I say that's the royal we, Julian, the yeah. royal one. <laughs> <laughs> but that they've looked at the streptomycin resistance, the STRA and B, in the environment, and, you know, it shows up in, in soil and water. So, I mean, they're present there. Um, but the risk of, you know, them them being consumed and impacting human or animal health, I, I don't know how high that risk is and at all. But we know, I mean, same for the tetracycline resistance genes, they've been found in many different environments. Yes, thank so. you. You just gave me the word, the human health and how it's been consumed because the pesticide um, risk assessment we are doing for the maximum residue levels is exactly focused on consumer dietary exposure. So we would need then uh, toxicological reference values for the components to be assessed. And then EFSA has, of course, the food consumption data. And putting everything together, I don't know if you're aware, but it's also on the EFSA website. There is the um, PRIMO model, the pesticide uh, risk assessment intake model. It's an Excel-based file for the time being. I mean, developments are ongoing but it can be downloaded from the website. And uh, yes, that is how we are doing the consumer exposure estimates to see whether the ADIs or the acute reference dose for certain pesticide residues are exceeded or not. So whether then an MRL is safe, so our recommendations to the risk managers uh, are safe for consumers. Just maybe to yeah. add this. Are, are there standards for for antibiotics listed on there, like the residue? Uh yes, we also, we also take consideration of the animal dietary burden. So the meat that is then being consumed, that is also being uh, included in the calculation. So we also have MRIs for animal commodities. Okay. okay. <laughs> so group so yeah, <laughs> but, but that's fine I, I think we, we, we have uh, a lot of very nice ideas that, that have been shared uh, during this uh, exchange and uh, probably we, we have to stress again the need of data quality data uh, for risk assessments and, and to address this question is, is there a risk for, for human health uh, by using antibiotics as plant protection products and so uh, um, we we have to progress on this, but I think Jonathan is reacting, so please. Well, I, I, don't know about, I don't know about bacteria, but I've read about fungicides. And, and there it's become a very big issue because there, there are very few fungicides that are actually approved for use for human mycoses. Mm -hmm. And, and there, there's, there's, there's big issues there because there's fungal resistance to these these drugs that are used for treating human beings, and it's directly linked to the use of fungicides in agriculture. So, I mean, I think the risk is there. And, and I fully agree, this, this is a risk, yes. Azole resistance is, is really an issue, yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, the idea of collecting 
you know, more data is is complicated one and you you demonstrated that with, you know, being able to find the information, translate it, you know, but also that this is one of my pet peeves in science is, you know, the publication of negative data. And, you know, so a lot of times there's data out there that it's never been published because it's not accepted or because, like, for instance, my Ohio data really isn't novel. It's, it's novel for my producers and very important for them. But, you know, it's in the grand scheme of things that data has been reported before um, from other states. So I think, you know, the negative data and not getting data out there also is an, another challenge you know, that the research has been done in a lot of cases and there are data, but they're not in a published manner. So that's another challenge in your, in your uh, scoping review. <laughs> so. so thank you very much, uh, all of you. Thank you very much to all those who presented and offered a talk uh, during this session. Uh, um, and thank you also to those who participated. So proposed some ideas, some questions, and we will try to follow on with these uh, in, in the near future. Mm -hmm. And we may come back to all those who attended. Uh, so thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>